Welcome to this regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is Monday, April 12th, 2010. Could we have the roll call, please? Chair Swift Kayata. Here. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Wall. Here. Time for the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, it is the time for town council reports and correspondence. Is there any councillor that has a report? Jim? I have two re reports. Uh, the first one is the, um, the report of the, the Fort Williams Advisory um, Council. I met with them at their last meeting, uh, and they have planned, uh, and that was discussion about revenue and re revenue generating ideas and suggestions and the work that will be done around some of those op options. And uh, the uh, Advisory uh, Council has uh, they have engaged in another meeting this Thursday evening, and they have a facilitator that will work with the group. And they're really um, going back through the history and looking at the original documentation and the purposes of the park, and the, basically looking at what the fundamental uh, basis for Fort Williams is, and looking at making sure that whatever decisions that they go forward with in terms of work will be done in concert with what the ultimate mission of this park is. So it's a first step and one that I think is a good one and a positive one that I think uh, uh, should generate some uh, a basis for us to go forward with the work around revenue opportunities that are available in Fort Williams Park. Thank you. That's the first one. And second, you have uh, at each one of your uh, seats, uh, you have uh, a draft copy of a communication strategy. Uh, the manager uh, and I uh, spent some time back and forth talking about this uh, particular issue. And uh, you remember the first, uh, at the top of the page, you have the objective the town council seeking to enhance more effective citizen participation in local government will implement a communication strategy to be more effective providing information to citizens on municipal services and on local issues. And uh, it's a rather lengthy document. It's not intended for today, tonight's reading. This is for you to take from today's meeting and uh, read it. And uh, the suggestion is that either we discuss it at our next meeting or consider getting public input at that time or possibly scheduling it as part of a workshop in an upcoming meeting. This will be loaded on the website tomorrow for all uh, citizens to read. And uh, I just would appreciate it if there's anyone who has any comments about it or suggestions or, again, this uh, needs to be uh, something we're all behind 100 percent. And I appreciate the manager's effort uh, to, uh, to move this along as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim. It looks like there's been a lot of work that went into it so far. Um, one of our council goals, as you mentioned, is to enhance <coughs> excuse me, citizen participation and communication. And we had originally scheduled um, that goal to be discussed at a workshop in May, but the budget uh, meetings had to be moved around. So I suggest, since uh, it, it is sometimes difficult to discuss something like this at a formal town council meeting, that a workshop might be the better venue for us to discuss it. But we can all review it and uh, send you our thoughts and, and move on from there. But Mike and I will be meeting, I think, to discuss when some of these goals um, uh, there was a little schedule moving around of the workshops that needed to be done, so um, we'll get to it as soon as we possibly can. But, but I guess we, we felt that we needed to get this thing moving yes. and to get something formal in front of us that yes. we can then get to the citizens so that uh, you know, we, people can weigh in on what they think and how they, things ought to be prioritized going forward. Yes, and I think it'll be good to get the citizen input on it, so uh, they'll be able to see it on the website, as you said, the draft but I want to emphasize that it is a draft at this point so that people don't get confused. Thank you. Any other um, reports from councillors? Penny. Uh, yes. I just wanted to um, 
congratulate the Cape Elizabeth uh, High School Environmental Club on their um, Eco Excellence Award, which is given, um, awards are given annually by Eco Maine to uh, member communities. And this year, the Environmental Club was one of the recipients. And it was as a result of the uh, composting of food waste and the reduction, I should say, of the, uh, the increase of the uh, recycling that's being done in the schools. <coughs> And basically, these awards are given in order to recognize projects in um, member communities that are increasing recycling, as well as having a positive environmental impact. And I just wanted to congratulate the uh, high school environmental club on receiving this award. Great. Thank you. Dave. Uh, the Municipal Operations Review Committee is continuing its work, and we will be meeting next week, April 15th. Uh, with the goal of the uh, issuing a report to the council, I believe, by the July deadline. So that work is continuing. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Sarah. Um, on March 19th in the morning, I met with Carol Hubbard, who has been the liaison person to cool communities trying to bring some of their recommendations to Cape. We talked with her and had a presentation last year. I met with her and Sandy Amborn, who's the cool communities liaison for the Sierra Club. Um, we had a great meeting and brainstormed a lot of ideas of what they'd like to do and essentially boiled it down for the short term that they would like to um, very much get involved in helping the schools recycle more and thought maybe they could partner with the environmental club and somehow bring them, you know, so it would be a three-part process. And um, Sandy um, Amborn mentioned that there's these $10,000 block grants that this year gives out for the, just this kind of initiative to students in education. So she's going to walk us through the process of trying to apply for that, which is great. The second um, suggestion was an anti-idling campaign, a largely, I guess, uh, citizen education. That's Carol's um, big project right now. And so I learned some interesting things. And so that's, we'd like to get started. We're going to meet in a smaller group. Um, hopefully with maybe the person who's the recycling committee and, and, and the um, environmental club advisor from the high school. And the third thing was she wanted to show the movie Trash. I think she spoke to you uh, um, at some point this spring in this room to try to, she thought it would tie in nicely to our whole discussion of the paper bag. So it was productive and nice and it's great to have her working on our behalf. <coughs> I have a question. I don't know what that movie is about. I suspect it's about trash. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I, I hope that's, I hope that's what it's about. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having had high schoolers, I yeah. know some other yeah, meanings for that word. Movie. Um, I think, it's a, I think it's a whole look at the next one. industry and how you get rid of your garbage. I was wondering, perhaps, I don't know if the, all the copyrights would allow, if perhaps after we see it, it would be something that could be put on the website. I'll look into it. Not on, I'm sorry, not on the website, on Channel 3. It's a great idea. She Jeff said it's interesting. Plenty of open movie. spaces, so. Anyways. So I'll keep you posted as we <coughs> come up with dates. Other reports from counselors. Okay. Um, I had a couple things I just wanted to mention. Um, I attended the Mork public input session last month and found that very um, interesting. I've heard a lot of interesting ideas, and I look forward to um, the continued work of the committee, I know they're working hard, and so I wanted to say thank you, because I know it's hard going sometimes. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Public Works, the Public Works Department, uh, and the town employees who have worked on the town cleanup uh, of all the debris and the trees and the branches and stuff that came down in the big storm we had uh, in March. It, took, uh, it got delayed a little bit because of uh, some heavy rainstorms, but I understand that they finished their work last week, and that was a big effort, and I just wanted to recognize their um, great work on that. So thank you to Bob Malley and to all his folks. And um, we'll move on now. It is time for the citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Okay, no one is here for that. Uh, town manager's report. Yeah, I, I think the councilors have covered most of the highlights quite well, so I'll uh, suggest we move on. Okay. Um, next, it's time for the minutes of the meeting 
for March 8, 2010. Do I hear a motion? I, I move that we approve the minutes of March 8. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or are there any corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a public hearing on some zoning ordinance amendments for, on town center density. But before we get to the public hearing, I think it would be useful if we heard a brief review of what these are about, um, what these changes are about. And for that, I will turn to David Sherman, who is the chair of the ordinance committee. Uh, certainly. Uh, just to give you a little bit of the historical background uh, at our excuse me, at the uh, planning board's meeting of September 18th of 2009. The board voted six to zero to recommend amendments to the town center district of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the ordinance committee then began its review of the town center amendments last fall. At the time, the ordinance committee consisted of Sarah Lennon as chair, David Backer, and me. Uh, we met a couple of times regarding the town center amendments, but then the election <coughs> came along uh, we had a uh, change in the makeup of the town council and of the ordinance committee. So at that time, we decided to wait until we had the uh, new uh, members in place to continue our review. And at that, uh, as of uh, December then of last year, the ordinance committee consisted of uh, Jim Walsh, Frank Governale, and me. Uh, we began or restarted the review of the town center uh, amendments uh, by taking a look at the comprehensive plan and the town center plan so that the three members of the committee would have a context for reviewing these proposed amendments to the town center district. Uh, we met then an additional two times after completing our review of the comprehensive plan and the town center plan to discuss the town center amendments. And what the amendments do are there are primarily two changes. Uh, they allow for multi-story buildings within the town center district uh, to be more than 50% residential, provided that the first floor of the building is 100% non-residential. So therefore, there could be a three-story building in the town center district. The first floor would be completely non-residential. The, the second and third floors could be residential apartments. That, that of course, would be more than 50% of the space devoted to, not, to uh, residential apartments but that would be permissible under the proposed change to the town center amendments. Uh, the other change uh, has to do with density requirements. Uh, right now, there is a requirement of 7,500 square feet of lot size per residential unit within a multi-family uh, building in the town center. The proposed amendment reduces, or, well, reduces the number of square feet required to 3,000 square feet per residential unit, which means that the building could be more dense, could have more apartment units uh, within the building. Uh, the, the reason that the planning board and now the town council is being asked to consider these amendments uh, is a response to the comprehensive plan. Uh, and Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, will get into more detail about the comprehensive plan uh, but the, the, the goal here is to, uh, to focus on two particular aspects of the comprehensive plan. One, which is to pro promote a more vibrant town center, which includes the development of mixed-use buildings within the town center district. That's both a, a building that has both commercial uses and residential uses. Another uh, goal of the comprehensive plan, which these amendments speak to, is to promote the diversity of housing types uh, to accommodate residents of all age groups and household sizes within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, another issue that I think, uh, that, or that I know that the Ordinance Committee considered, uh, were the specific lots that would be impacted by these uh, proposed amendments. Uh, what we're, we're focusing again is the town center, the most likely uh, lots that would be affected by these amendments if they are passed would be the lot next door to the town hall as well as the lot near the high school and uh, we and Maureen will get into some of the details here as well during her presentation but we considered what impact these amendments would have on these lots in particular should they be passed and the obvious impact is that those buildings could be built 
with up to potentially 10 apartment units. And we, we then talked about what that would look like should that come to pass. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Maureen O'Meara so she can get into some more of the specifics. Pretty much covered it all. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's no problem. <laughs> Uh, so what I've done is I've just done a really quick presentation, and I'm going to go over it, but if there's anything that I missed that you have questions about, please feel free to jump in. Um, so this is the town center district. It, basically from the north, it starts where Hillway intersects with Route 77. It extends to the south where Route 77 intersects with Fowler Road and with Old Ocean House Road. It also extends down Shore Road to the old community center, now Dr. Johnson's medical building. And it also extends down uh, Scott Dyer Road to the western edge of the school campus. So all that area in purple is the town center district. And the amendments you're considering would only apply in this area. So um, David had asked me, please, go right ahead. If, uh, Maureen, just. Yes, thank you. Which section is the town center core subdistrict? Okay, you see this little stripey area yep. in here? That's the That's core subdistrict. The only difference between this area and the rest of the purple is that you're allowed to have 10,000 square foot single family lots in there with site plan review from the planning board. Extremely narrow, minor, little adjustment. Very much a uniform uh, district otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Um, so why do we care about the comprehensive plan? And what we keep telling people is that um, whenever a town adopts land use regulations, you affect the value of personal property. And that's something that a town has the legal right to do. However, you're not supposed to be entering into that lightly. You're supposed to actually have um, good reasons to regulate what people can do on their property, promoting a public purpose, convenience. and in order to have the right to adopt zoning ordinances in the state of Maine, you have to have a comprehensive plan. And a comprehensive plan basically says the town has thought about what it wants for land use. And then you've adopted land use regulations that are consistent with the comprehensive plan that you've prepared. And this is just the language out of the state statute that says that. You have to have a comprehensive plan before you have zoning. So the town of Cape Elizabeth, you periodically update your comprehensive plan. Um, and the newest comprehensive plan, which uh, I'm sure you all recognize, looks like this right here, wonderful document. Uh, this was adopted in October of 2007. Um, and when you write a comprehensive plan, you can't just throw it together and put anything you want in it. You have to actually, you have to actually address state goals, which are in the state comprehensive plan rule. Then you submit your comprehensive plan to the state, and they determine whether or not you've prepared a plan which is actually consistent with state goals. And the town has done that as well. We have a letter from the state that says, good job. Um, the comprehensive plan includes 91 recommendations. The state requires that you actually designate which recommendations are the highest priority, and you start working on those first. So the town identified 33 of those 91 recommendations, and they said they were the ones that had to be implemented short term, which is in the first three years. And of those 33 recommendations, the vast majority of them are land use regulation changes. So in order to facilitate, facilitate actually implementing those recommendations, we took all those recommendations, those short term ones, and we put them into five overall land use packages. And the good news is you're halfway there. So the shoreland zoning has been adopted and the BA district overhaul has been adopted. And you've got the agricultural amendments nipping at your tail here. And what we have tonight is a piece of the land use package, which is the town center amendments. Um, and where those are coming out of is, the, again, the comprehensive plan is 14 different chapters, 14 different topic areas. The first chapter is economy. And uh, the goal right here basically says the town center is the business section in Cape Elizabeth. And there are several recommendations that talk about how to promote making the town center more of the main business district area. And the one we're dealing with is number three, which is develop mixed use buildings that include commercial uses on the first floor and allow residential uses on the upper floors. <coughs> right now, 
Uh, there's a regulation in the town center that says that we want mixed-use buildings <coughs> because they promote uh, vibrancy in the town center. However, if you were to allow 100% um, residential buildings in a town like Cape Elizabeth where residential use is so extremely desirable, you would very quickly eat up what little business area you have with residential development. So the idea is that while you want some vibrancy and it's good to have people living in your downtown area, you also want to reserve some of your capacity for space, for commercial uses. So right now the ordinance says when you build a mixed-use building, only half of it can be residential. Half of it has to be commercial. Uh, and we've worked with this, it's been okay, but what we've learned is that it's kind of hard to take a three-story building and make half of one floor commercial and half of that same floor residential. And there are financial um, opportunities available if you can have a little bit more commercial. So the, the recommendation is to actually allow upper floors to be residential as long as your first floor stays commercial and Councillor Sherman described that. Um, the other thing here is we have a housing chapter and the housing chapter actually says that one of our goals should be to create some diversity of housing types. And in Cape Elizabeth, like in most towns, the vast majority of your residential units are in single family housing. And there's nothing wrong with that unless you're someone who can't afford a single family home yet, you're a young adult, or you're someone who's gotten mature enough to not want to maintain a single family home anymore and you, you would like to be able to transition into some other kind of housing. And at that point, those people, those groups, have a real hard time staying in Cape Elizabeth because there's so little opportunity for other housing types. So under the housing chapter, it actually says that we should encourage the development of multifamily housing units in mixed-use buildings located in the town business districts. And by increasing the amount of a building that can be have residential, you would be fulfilling number 12. Number 13 says, increase the permitted density of multifamily housing units in mixed-use buildings located in the business districts. So by requiring less amount of land area per unit of housing, you would be fulfilling uh, recommendation number 13 in the comprehensive plan. Uh, so just as just a summary of what uh, Councillor Sherman has already explained to you very eloquently, uh, the density would pretty much um, go down to half of what it is now. You'd be able to put in twice as many units as you're currently allowed to. Uh, and the question that kept getting asked by the ordinance committee is why is 3,000 square feet the magic number? Well, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a recommendation from the planning board and they, they work on this stuff all the time and they're presumed to have a little bit more expertise in land use. So for what it's worth, I'll throw that in there. Secondly, uh, we did do a survey of similar towns, uh, Kennebunk, Camden, we looked at Chatham, Mass, we looked at Bath, uh, and what we found is 3,000 is right in the range. There are some towns where in their central business district they have no minimum amount of area per residential dwelling unit. And then there are others that go up to 5,000. And then when you go out to other business districts, like neighborhood business districts, the density goes up. And that's also very consistent with what Cape Elizabeth has done in their business A district. And then third, we actually had a property owner that said, you know, 3,000 square feet would work a lot better for me than what you have right now. So I have more information on that if, if you want it, but that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing now and see if we have comments from the public. And then after the public hearing, um, I'll wait for a motion and then we can have discussion. If there are further questions for David or for Maureen, we can do the questions then. But at this moment, I'd like to declare the public hearing open for comments on the zoning ordinance amendments with regard to the town center density changes. Is there anyone who would like to speak? No one is approaching, so I will declare the public hearing closed. We will move on to item number 42, which is the zoning ordinance amendments with regard to the town center density. Do I hear a motion? I would move for the approval of the proposed amendments to the town center uh, district of the, of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? 
Um, right. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Maureen, for the, for the work on this um, and to uh, fellow uh, ordinance committee members. Um, I voted against this uh, proposal and continue to be uh, opposed to it for uh, several reasons uh, that I'd like to highlight. Um, first is I'm not a proponent of more density in uh, more density than we already have in the downtown area, recognizing what the, the uh, planning committee and the um, comprehensive plan had proposed. Uh, I'm still not a proponent of it, particularly in, in the lots that we're talking about, in particular the one in front of the high school where we're trying to promote more uh, walking, more biking. Uh, we have new drivers. I think more traffic than we already have uh, doesn't create an incremental benefit for us. Um, in addition, one of the objectives here is for greater vibrancy in the downtown. Um, you know, we have actually a lot of vacant space in the downtown. We actually have a lot of vacant office space uh, around town, and we have uh, even vacant um, town-owned space in downtown. I think creating more um, uh, commercial development or promoting uh, more opportunities for commercial development at this point in time is a little like putting the cart before the horse. We are, um, in some ways, making this building, uh, a building in these areas, uh, cheaper to build or higher return to build, which is what you're doing when you're permitting more revenue generating opportunities, is actually somewhat disadvantage, creates a disadvantage to existing property owners or existing building owners, rather, um, in the sense that it does promote more building uh, and we already have space uh, around the center of town that is vacant, creating more competition for them. Second, uh, the fact that it's being um, <clears throat> requested by uh, owners of the property doesn't um, carry much weight with me, quite frankly. Um, if I own the properties, I'd want more opportunities to generate more revenue as well. They, brought, they bought the property knowing what the zoning ordinances were, uh, what their opportunities were, and if they can't make a return at the price that they purchased them at, then clearly they paid too much. So it's not incumbent upon the town to make the economics of this equation change so that their returns improve. Um, and the third point is that um, I know that we are, uh, are trying to create a, uh, a vibrant uh, downtown, but I'd just like to remind everybody that a million dollar property in downtown generates, or a commercial property generates exactly the same revenue for the town as a million dollar home in Cross Hill. There's virtually no incremental benefit to the town from a revenue perspective for commercial development. Uh, and I think, as, uh, and I say that because I think it's easy for us to say, well, we like commercial development, it's good for our economy. Aside from the uh, benefits to the employees who construct the building, aside from the, um, uh, you know, the just temporary jobs, the economic benefit really doesn't exist, uh, isn't better than what we get from residential development. Um, and therefore, I think, considering the impact on traffic, considering the impact on existing building owners, uh, considering the impact on sort of the environment for the schools, um, it, it doesn't uh, persuade me to be in, uh, in favor of this proposal. Thank you, Frank. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? David. Um, and Frank and I are, have served on the Ordinance Committee together, and uh, we know where each other is coming from, but I essentially disagree with everything Frank has just said. Uh, I mean, the town center is supposed to be a vibrant uh, business slash residential district, and to say to property owners, tough luck, you paid too much, we're not going to try to assist in the development of your properties, I think that uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, if, if we are able to encourage the development of a lot next door, we're actually going to go from uh, tax revenues on a vacant lot, which are probably, I mean, Matt Sturgis is here, so I don't know what the town earns from that, but to tax revenues on a fully, revenues on a fully developed lot with a three-story building that's presumably a lot more valuable than an empty lot. Uh, I think the town will see a benefit from that. And, and, and people talk about encouraging commercial growth and business development in Cape, they don't mean everywhere in Cape. They mean in certain areas. We're not talking about existing neighborhoods. We're talking about the downtown center of Cape Elizabeth, which is not very big. Uh, this is not going to be a huge shift in the, the character of our town. We're talking about essentially the area from Fowler Road down to the gas station uh, and a little bit beyond that. 
Uh, I think it is incumbent upon this town council to pass these amendments. It is completely in conformance with the comprehensive plan's goals. In fact, I think if we didn't pass these proposed amendments, we would be acting uh, contrary to the comprehensive plan's goals. Uh, so I, I, I really do hope that my fellow members will join me in voting for uh, these uh, proposed amendments. Thank you, Dave. Anybody else? Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, I have a question, and then a few comments. Can you talk about the parking implications of what, how many spaces you need if you have 7,000 square feet and one layer of residential versus 10,000 and two on both lots? Yes. Good. Uh, <laughs> any of these, any, and I can do general, I can look it up, uh, but any of these developments that are proposed would trigger site plan review by the planning board. And under site plan review, the planning board must look at both traffic generation and parking. We have standards in the ordinance that require so many spaces uh, based on type of use. If you were to develop a, let's see, a 5,000 square feet is the maximum building footprint. And if you were to develop a 15,000 square foot building, 5,000 square feet, three floors, the first 5,000 square feet, uh, generally you need four spaces per thousand for a specific commercial use. So that's 20 spaces. Right? And then on the upper floors, it depends on how many units you have. You really are looking at one and a half to two spaces per dwelling unit. And what we've learned, and by we, I mean the planning board has learned, is that uh, there are some really good opportunities in the town center for what we call shared parking. That means that if you create a parking space and a certain use needs it basically from eight to five weekdays, and another use in the same building doesn't need that space from eight to five weekdays. They need it before eight in the morning, they need it after five at night, and they need it mostly on weekends. Those two uses can share the same space. So what we've learned is that when you develop these parking lots for commercial spaces, you usually don't have to create a larger parking lot when you put in the residential units because they can share the commercial spaces. But we actually calculate it out. So if you were to have four units on the second floor and four units on the third floor, that's eight <coughs> units, that's 16 spaces, plus you've got the 20 spaces you need for the first floor, that's 36 spaces. But I think you could make an argument that the 16 spaces that you need for the second and third floor could be shared with the first floor and you could stick with the 20 spaces or some reasonable compromise between 20 and 36. So what would you do on a Saturday morning when the people are still in their apartment sleeping and there's a commercial on the bottom floor that wants people to come shop? The retail use, for example, a cafe, um, that is calculated based on number of seats. So it's a little different than square footage. And if you did have a cafe, that's obviously a use that's not going to share as well as a office space. So you might carve out, you may say, of the 5,000 square feet on the first floor, let's say 2,000 square feet of it is actually a cafe. And so you would need, instead of the eight spaces that, the eight spaces that you would use for office space, you would subtract the eight from the 20, you'd get 12 spaces for the office space, and those 12 would be the ones that you could share with the upper floors for residential, and then you would have to calculate your cafe based on the number of seats, and that would be added on to the office space. So it's just a practical matter, let's mm -hmm. envision the lot at the high school entrance. How would that developer fit a three-story building and a parking lot in that space? We actually that? have an approved site plan on file where the developer created a two-and-a-half-story building with a parking lot, and it was approved by the planning board. Where was the parking lot? The parking lot was behind where the building that was there used to be. So you remember the, the two-and-a-half-story cape that was there? The developer had proposed building in addition uh, as you face the building to the right, and then there was room in the back for the parking lot. And the reality is, if you can't fit the parking on there, you can't get approval from the planning board. I mean, now, could you explain what you did to the, with the property next door? What I did with the property next, uh, the property next door is kind of the model site plan. That's the one that you can trot out and you can say, 
it still meets the standards. It's, you'd still love to see it developed. And with that one, um, I didn't change the exterior of the building at all. I, all I did was look at changing the uses inside the building. And you still, the parking would stay exactly the same. There's, the, there's plenty of parking to meet that use. The only, the only difference would be as you drove by at night, at 9 o'clock, there might be lights on on the second floor because there would be people living on the second floor as opposed to having office space on the second floor. So from the exterior, it wouldn't look any different. But you had shared parking too. Yeah, you had shared parking. So the parking lot behind this building was part of the shared parking arrangement. Right, and that, the shared parking we did there is what it did is it allowed, you have to fit your parking on your lot or you need to partner up with someone on an, an abutting lot. If you can't do that, you can't have a big enough building. You have to reduce the size of your building. And what the town did is if you can allow the property owner next door to build a bigger building, then they generate more tax revenue. We kept an eye out on what was going on behind the town hall during the day. And on, every, on a daily basis, there was at least 20 empty spaces back there. Because the real demand on this parking lot is when you have a big public meeting. So the idea was, okay, we told the property owner next door when we sell you the lot, we'll also give you permission to have 18 shared spaces. And at night, when you don't need those spaces because you have an office use there for two of your floors, we'll, we can flow into your parking lot as long as you have enough spaces for your apartment. So it still works under this proposal. Do you have any more questions, Sarah? Actually, I have a few comments, but if you have a lot of questions for me, I can. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I've certainly read the comprehensive plan, and I um, am very much in favor of promoting business within the parameters of the comprehensive plan. But this worries me with, in particular, with that lot in particular. I'm trying to envision a ten apartment unit building right there at the entrance to the high school. I'm, I'm concerned about commercial traffic as well as residential traffic in and out of that driveway and thinking of our young drivers and uh, so forth and I'm just kind of concerned about how that would impact and I don't know if that's been looked at or like I said, when we looked at this as a scenario, we took a site plan that had already been approved by the planning board. So it's private property. Yeah. Someone can come in tomorrow and bring in a site plan, and we, the planning board would have to review it based on the current standards. And as long as they provided their parking, as long as they met the design standards, as long as they provided a traffic analysis that showed they weren't creating an accident situation, they could receive approval for a three-story commercial building now. And I mean, I, I've looked at these recommendations, and the only difference I see really happening is the mix of uses within the building. The, the size building that you're going to have is going to be basically the same. The look of the building is going to be basically the same. You might have uh, fewer trips during the time that people are getting out of school if you have more residential uses in the building because you tend to have residential uses, traffic peaking at the commuter hour, which is 5.30, 4.30 to 5.30 to 6.30 at night. So if you're looking at traffic differences, you might actually have you know, less traffic at the time that um, students are in the school building. But again, even if you, were to, if you weren't to adopt this tonight, someone could still build a three-story building on that property. They could still add traffic to Route 77. They would just be re restricted by the, the site plan uh, regulations that are currently in place. Now, does that regulation allow for traffic to enter and leave from the high school driveway? The, no, that, no the, the, I, the high school driveway is not owned by the property owner at the 349 Ocean House Road. It's owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. And just like any other property owner in town, uh, no one has the right to go onto that property without getting the permission of the property owner, which is you. Um, so if anyone wanted to develop 349 Ocean House Road and they wanted to use the high school driveway, they would have to come to the council 
and get your permission to do that, not as a site plan review requirement, but because you are the representatives of the owner of the high school driveway. Uh, but they still could go out directly onto Route 77 as long as they can meet traffic requirements. Hang on, I just want to clarify one thing and then Penny's next. Um, so I'd, I just want to make sure I understand. So the question before us really is not so much what we can do at either one of those lots. It's what we can now do under the current rules versus what we possibly could do if we approve these amendments. That's right. So the difference then is that um, perhaps Perhaps if I could ask you to reemphasize what the difference is, because we're talking about how many units, but I'm trying to, that there would be in a building. But I'm interested in sort of what's the differential. Mm -hmm. um, so given those, since we're talking about those two lots, mm -hmm. and you already know this, uh, and probably you talked about this in the Ordinance Committee, but the rest of us didn't hear that discussion. For instance, that lot that's down at the um, high school corner, mm -hmm. currently you could have under that approved site plan, the previous one. You could have businesses on the first floor, and then what could you have on the second and third floors and those are, now a, yeah. then versus what you could have? It's really important to remember these two lots were picked be, as scenarios, okay. as a good example to illustrate what this ordinance change would do. But there are definitely other properties in the town center where someone could walk in tomorrow and say, I've decided I want to do this, and they could use these standards. We picked these two lots because they had existing site plans approved on those lots, and it, it, it limits staff's ability to be subjective. I can mm -hmm. point to specific instances. So for example, on the, the property uh, next to the high school, um, that's 349 Ocean House Road, that a received planning board approval for 1,633 square feet of retail space, 3,898 square feet of personal service space, 1,674 square feet of office space, and four residential units. Okay, and that's uh, under the current rules. Under the current rules, it received approval for that. If you were to uh, increase the density so that you needed 3,000 square feet per residential dwelling unit, I tried to rearrange the floor plans within what was already there. I think it's reasonable to assume that you would still have 629 square feet of retail space 2,212 square feet of personal space, and then you could have up to 10 residential units. So I, I'm not very good at adding in my head, but That's so fine. the total of sort of the non-residential space went down? It went down, and what I did is I took the existing floor plans and I said, okay, if you can do this on the third floor, you can do it on the second floor. And that's how I was able to double the number of units. And then I so you got budged a little bit more so I could calculate, okay, this is what I came up with with so commercial you, space. I'm sorry. So using this example right. you just cited, you got m more residential units. You went from how many to 10? I went from four, four to, to 10. ten. But you de decreased the commercial space. Yes. So, yes, you would have okay. to because it's... I, I still think that it would basically be the same building because people... From the outside. From the outside. The town center is, is really designed to be a village center. And one of the things we picked out of other ordinances that uh, really regulate village center is we put a building footprint limitation. Because if you build these big boxy buildings, you lose that village feel. So that really tends to be your first limiting factor. You can't have a building that has a footprint greater than 5,000 square feet. You can have more than one building on a lot, but you also have to have enough parking. Okay. Okay. So, so the that, building is that pretty net, much going to stay the same. Net, net, the building pretty much looks the same from the outside. Yep. But in terms of its usage, mm -hmm. today's building that you could build versus, you know, next week's building. It would be more. It could be more residential mm -hmm. and less commercial. Next. Yes. Penny's next. You actually, Anne, you asked uh, one of my questions. But um, as we look at this change, and I look at the fact that by reducing the square footage, it, it actually uh, makes additional properties in the, in the town center even more attractive for development because of the density relative to uh, rental or residential, being, 
having apartments. And so was there any discussion at all about the ripple effect that could take place down 77 toward where Norm Jordan lives, toward Fowler Road, and how buildings could potentially pop up along that way because it does become more attractive to build these buildings. Those, those two properties are already in the town center district. Right. And the, the Reich property, which is right next to the property next to the high school driveway, uh, representatives of the property owner have approached the town for the last 10 years talking about potential for development there. Uh, no one from Norm Jordan has said, I really want to do something with my property, but that doesn't mean they, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, but there's still opportunities in other parts of town where people could redevelop existing properties. So again, those, this lot here, that lot there were, were chosen just as samples because we already had site plans that were approved and we didn't have to, we didn't have to look more subjective than we needed to. You all set, Penny? Okay. Uh, Frank and then Sarah again. I just want to clarify a couple of points. Mm -hmm. uh, one, on, in terms of traffic, you, you highlighted the fact that there would be um, perhaps incrementally more traffic in the evening, but it would seem to me if it's residential, you'd also have more traffic in the morning, precisely when the kids are going to school. Mm -hmm. If when people, but again, it depends on what the commuter hour is. Uh, you know, 7.30 is, is the big time. If you've got people who are working at 9, then it'll be a little bit later. But yes, you could definitely still have that same traffic. And so just to follow, follow up on Frank, it also, it, also, it also tends to, the makeup of the people who would occupy these apartments, you know, the chances are they're going to be, I know that in next door when we designed that, and I was part of the group that did not get that, that particular project, there were four residential units. And they were one bedroom or two bedroom units, they're certainly not going to have three and four children living in them. And more than likely, they'll be single or a more mature uh, couple who wish to stay in town and have just this option. So I'm not so sure there's going to be that sort of traffic influx that we're talking about here. That building, the second floor, was going to be a hotel style. Uh, business office with um, with upwards to something on the order of 35 um, cubicles, or call it whatever you will, with shared services. And the first floor was 5,000 square feet, which was going to be cafe and some retail and warehousing or some back room facilities as part of that 5,000. So I, I'm not so sure that we're going to get this influx of of traffic that people talk about the way because I, I just don't I just don't see that happening with the kind of people that would be attracted to these units although we're not really capable we're not really um, capable of predicting how these things develop yeah. I mean the, the fact is it can be residential it can be people who are working and leaving at the same time the other thing is um, to follow up on uh, Ann's question she asked um, you, uh, if you increase the in your assumption you increase the residential space and made a commensurate decrease in the commercial, right? But uh, this would also allow you to increase it, the, I think, tell me, tell me if my logic is correct, increase the residential because of the 3,000, change to 3,000, without decreasing the, the uh, commercial. You, you would still have to decrease it because you've only got your... You to know, get to the full 10. Yeah. Right. You can go yeah. something less than the 10 and still have Right. You, I mean, there's some opportunity to take large two-bedroom units and turn them into one-bedroom units and stay on the same floor. So you might be able to take a third floor that had four and, and up it to five or maybe six, but to, to maximize the full density, and we're hearing that that's what people would want to do for other financial reasons, you would have to reduce some of your commercial space. Sarah. But you're still going to have the one first floor to in 100%. Yes, right. the, the ordinance would still require that the first floor would have to remain non-residential. Sarah, did you have another comment or question? Um, I have a few comments. Uh, uh, first of all, I think it's interesting that the two lots that are in question are sitting empty. So obviously, there's reasons why they're not particularly attractive to develop right now. I, the high school one to me is a complete no-brainer. There's just, it's just 
it's such a busy place and there are kids everywhere and and it's just to me it's if I were a developer I would not want to develop right there at the entrance to the high school but you know it's kind of like it's not very good to start with so we keep trying to sweeten the deal a little bit to get somebody to build there but you know maybe it's just not the greatest place to build and I don't I agree with Frank that it's not our responsibility to sweeten the deal enough to try to entice somebody to build a building that I frankly don't think um, particularly benefits the other 9,000 residents of the town. It might be great for the few people who live there, but when people talk to me about vibrancy in the town center and a village feel, this, it, larger buildings with more parking is not what they're envisioning. What they're envisioning is um, things that are inviting for all the people who live around town to come to the center to do, i.e. sidewalks that they can walk on, um, good biking places, cafes, you know, maybe even a bench to sit down on or a little green space, places actually that they aren't in their car, but rather are out of their car meeting each other and talking and sort of feeling community. So to me, this is the antithesis of that, is adding yet more asphalt to an already very asphalt-heavy center and encouraging people to be in cars rather than out of cars. So to me, it doesn't pass the face, straight face test of creating a village feel and vibrancy, and I would um, strongly disagree that the comparisons that you guys did are comparable. We're not at all like Kenny Bunker Camden. Those are pretty built up downtowns and they have a very different feel than Cape. I think people move to Cape because they're not a Kenny Bunker or Camden. They're more rural. And I know I know you think that the sort of rural feeling in the center doesn't apply, but I'm not sure that everyone in town agrees with that. Um, and the other thing I would say is that um, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> it happens to me all the time. I had one more point I wanted to make. Um, I'll think of it. Somebody else can talk. Oh, wait, sorry, I remember. <laughs> the, the, you know, there's, it's interesting to me, too, that there are lots and lots of for rent signs around our town right now with condos both here and behind Rudy's and, as Frank mentioned, you know, open space for, for shops or, or commercial use or anything that that aren't being filled. So it's kind of like, why are we put, trying as hard as we can to get people to build more when the pre-existing buildings are not even being filled? It seems counterintuitive. So I guess at, at the present moment, I'm opposed to this. David. I just would, again, encourage the members of the council to look at the comprehensive plan. Uh, this proposed amendment uh, is exactly uh, promoting what is in the comprehensive plan, but I, you know, I, I don't want to just have, leave you with, with the impression that I'm some sort of automaton and I just look at the comp plan and that's all I do. I do think this makes sense, uh, and when you talk about vibrancy downtown and people walking around and having a coffee shop and a nice bench to sit on, well, a, 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 a logical group of people that you might see walking downtown are those who live downtown and a logical place for a coffee shop might be in the, the lot next door to the, to, the, to the town hall. And I don't know how many people came up to me when I was running for town council a couple of falls ago saying, can't you do something about that lot next door to the town hall? Well, yeah. one thing we can do is make it more attractive for that to actually be developed. And we, we did actually hear from the gentleman who owns the lot next door to the town hall and he uh, very strongly stated that the addition of rental income, which would occur as a result of the increase in the, in the allowable density, would, make, would turn this project into an economically viable one. I know we can't guarantee that the building will actually get built. And I recognize that there are vacant prop, uh, uh, storefronts around the, the town center district. But we got we got a plan for the future of what the town center is going to look like and when the economy does rebound i want to have a, a downtown uh center that's going to be more attractive for people to come and, and build these uh projects so I, I again i really do encourage the members of the council to vote in favor of this um i'd, I'd like to weigh in i'm going to be supporting the motion and the reason i'm supporting it and i wasn't decided till i heard all the conversation but um, I have several reasons. I don't think, at least in my own mind, we're not here to try to get, to peop get people to build more or to try to sweeten the pot for anybody. That doesn't even come into my thinking. Um, 
I think it's very important that we follow the comprehensive plan, not because it's just written down or something, but that plan, as speaking as someone who worked two years on that committee, that plan is like the constitution of the town. It is the long range plan, long range, it's like 10 to 15 years, but it's the 10 to 15 year plan of the town, and it is based in great part on the critical insights survey that um, was done uh, in which the people of Cape Elizabeth, a scientifically significant uh, sample, um, which was statistically a significant sample, indicated what they wanted done in their town center, what they wanted the town to be like, and what they indicated was they wanted most of the town to be residential. They wanted most of the town to have sort of a, a rural or small towny kind of feel. They wanted the development of the town, the, the so-called business development, it's barely business, but business development of the town to be in the town center. So the first reason I'm supporting this is because it, it, it does follow the comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan, as, as I know we all know from following what's happened in other towns, that really sort of rules what our ordinances and zoning is supposed to be like. Scarborough got into a whole bunch of trouble a couple of years ago with that, I don't know, great American neighborhood or whatever, that um, they went against their comprehensive plan. And um, I think we should do it not just, we should follow our comprehensive plan, not just for legal reasons, but because I really do believe it's the essence of what people want. It's sort of the boiled down version of what people in Cape Elizabeth want. Um, the second reason I support this motion and these amendments is that I do think it's important to offer alternative housing. Not a lot. There's not very many lots in the whole scheme of things this is going to apply to. But alternative housing, meaning apartments, there's not single family bigger homes, to senior citizens. And um, because people who want to stay in town but want to downsize from their bigger houses. And also to provide an option for people who want to work, uh, walk, not drive to services. I do think this would mean there would be more people living in downtown, which sounds a little overinflated for what the town center is, but I do think there would these changes would mean there would be more people residing in the town center and frankly there would be less commercial traffic versus what is possible today. It's not, it doesn't mean that we're going to go to no commercial traffic uh, if we just stick with what we've got. It just means if we go to this newer version of the zoning we're going to have more of a swing towards options for people to reside down, downtown. Um, I think that site plan, the third reason is that I, I understand everybody's concerns about traffic and you know all sorts of things, especially ne over next to the high, sc high school. But I think site, site plan review will allow plenty of uh, public input. Their citizens in town are not shy about expressing their opinions about things. And I think it will prevent bad development, as will the, the planning board. Um, I hear complaints about the lot next door on a regular basis that it has not been developed. And I hear a lot of people say it would be nice to have a little cafe or coffee shop or whatever on the first floor. And I really don't think people would mind having six, eight, ten, I don't know how many could go next door, but ten uh, senior citizen couples or maybe some young singles, you know, young professional singles. Uh, living there, I think that would actually be an asset to the community rather than having it be sort of a, a half overgrown asphalt track next door. I, I think that'd be nice and I hear that from a lot of people. I don't hear many people saying they like what's next door right now. Uh, yes, the economy is sort of crummy right now and so nobody's developing much of anything, but I think we need to think about the future when the economy's rebounding and I like what these changes would be. I think it would make a vibrant downtown, and so I'll be supporting them. Anybody? Jessica? Yes, I'd like to make another comment. I, I'm kind of torn by this because um, I, have a, I do have an issue with a comprehensive plan talking and 
and I have great respect for it and, and the work that was involved in developing it. Although I kind of like the way the town is now. <laughs> so I don't, I've never seen a great need for change. However, I do have a lot of respect for the rights of a private property owner. And it is, uh, you know, significant to me that these site plans have already been approved, you know, for development. And um, so I'm, I'm weighing this as we all speak. Sarah? I just would like to take a little bit of issue with the notion that the comp plan is now our Bible. First of all, I would disagree that it was what everybody wanted in town. As I recall, the land use sections, which are the very things we're grappling with now, were highly contentious. And in the public hearings we had about them, there were more people speaking out against increasing density, both in the areas, the growth area, where the developments were going to go, and in the town center than any other section. And, and it was voted in by a committee of very hard working, I totally agree, I think 16 members, and then it was voted by the town council with the provision that we would have to put these ordinances in place in order for it to be signed, sealed, and delivered, and with the assurance that we would have time, room to debate and discuss and that we wouldn't necessarily have to adopt them book, chapter, and verse. That was the deal. So to then turn around and say, well, this is actually signed, sealed, and delivered, and so we shouldn't be changing any of it is, to me, strikes me as not quite playing by the rules. Second point is the, why are we looking at changing the density in the town center to not match the, the density in the BA district? In other words, what's wrong with having the town center be like the BA district in terms of allowed density? And Marie can speak to that. I mean, the, we, we did actually reduce the density, or I always get this mixed up. In the, in the BA district, we went from 15,000 to 7,500. Uh, square feet for the for the allow for the allowable density. So we, as an ordinance committee and as a town council, agreed to uh, increase the allowable density within the BA district. And so it seemed to me, uh, as a member of the ordinance committee, that it was logical to allow for greater density within the town center, which is even more like a, bus a downtown business district than the neighborhood business districts, which are. Uh, you have the one over on 77 by Rudy's, which is near the entrance to Broad Cove, and then you have the one over uh, on Shore Road, which we actually voted to enlarge to accommodate one of the property owners over there. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I feel like this is entirely consistent with the BA zoning amendments that we approved uh, last year. But if, but if we if we think 7,500 is a good number for the BA district, I'm just curious what, what the thinking is that the town center shouldn't have a comparable density if we like that look and feel. Well, the, the, the BA districts are considered to be neighborhood business districts. They, they are viewed differently in how they're described in the ordinance. Uh, the, the town center is not described as a neighborhood uh, business district. Ma Maureen has something to add yeah, the, the town center is your main business district. This is, there are many people when you were doing the business, a, the BA district, who said, why are you doing this in our neighborhood? It belongs in the town center. There's a general perception that the town center is the main commercial area and that the business A districts, the neighborhood districts, are kind of like business light. So it would make sense that the density in the neighborhood business districts would be lower than the density you would allow in your main business district. And it's consistent with what you can see in other communities. Their density goes up in the main village area, and it goes down as you get to the smaller business districts, and then you get to the residential districts. It's very standard. And now, in what you did in the business day, just to remind you, the minimum, the minimum amount of land area you needed uh, for a dwelling unit was 15,000 square feet, and you cut that in half to 7,500 which is consistent with what the comprehensive plan was recommending. And now you're taking the town center district, which is currently at 7,500, and basically cutting that in half to 3,000. I, I have to respond, Sarah. The, the reason I mentioned the comp plan as being the Constitution is that's sort of how it's viewed in the state. But as I said, the reason, my reasoning for supporting this is not just follow it because it's in the comp, you know, because it's listed in the comp plan. It's because I remember from being on the comp plan, plan committee and, and discussing this, you know, at 
ad nauseum, sorry, Maureen, for <laughs> months. I agree. Um, <laughs> is that there was a, a great deal of discussion that whatever commercial development we had in town should be pretty much, aside from a couple of little neighborhood zones, it should be focused in the town center. And that came about not just because of the 12 or 15 or however many people there were on the comp plan um, committee, but that ultimately we came to out on that where we were because, as a recommendation to the council, be, um, in great part because that survey of the whole citizenry showed what people valued in town, the natural environment, the schools, you know, whatever. We don't have to go through the whole thing. But they, they also, the big housing thing that I remember is that they wanted, there was a strong um, minority that, that said, I really want to have an option for when I'm, you know, downsizing when I'm a little more senior citizen kind of person, that I don't have to move away from the town that I know and love and have contributed to and raised my kids in to have that option. And then they also said on the, in the economy section that they wanted to um, have the option for having some uh, coffee shop or whatever. We're never going to get big commercial developments here. You know, I that IGA strip mall can't keep tenants in there because there's just not enough uh, business to support lots of businesses here. I just think that these changes would make it more of a village kind of feel, more like Yarmouth. We're never going to be not Yarmouth either, but a little more like Yarmouth, a little village-y kind of place where there, people can walk around to businesses and be on the street as opposed to getting in their car and driving around, which is much more of a suburban mode. So, Frank and then Penny. Just to respond, Jessica made a, um, a comment regarding um, sort of the uh, need to make sure property owners' rights are protected. This change uh, doesn't change. This is a change. That we're not affecting at all their existing rights. Just want to clarify that point. Thank you. Penny. I, I don't necessarily, actually I don't disagree at all with creating more housing alternatives in town. What I get concerned about is empty storefronts. Uh, driving down a street and seeing empty storefronts. Um, and so I just, I just, I wonder if we, will we be able to attract the businesses to fill those storefronts. I think it's great having mixed communities and having more housing options. Uh, but I really do get concerned about empty storefronts along the main street in uh, Cape Elizabeth, especially if we want people to be purchasing houses in the community. And I, I share that concern. It's not good to have empty storefronts. It just depresses the community in more ways than one, but I think this change would allow a slight, slightly higher percentage of residential units in terms of the whole building to sort of support the, the residential rents, to support what's going and on subsidize what's yeah. going on on the first floor to make the whole building more viable and less likely to be empty storefronts. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And that was the response that we got from the gentleman who owns the lot next door to the town hall. I, I, I think, I don't know if Jim can speak to this issue. It's exactly the same issue. With, yeah. with, that, that the rent stream coming from the, the rental, if you will, was, a, was considered by the underwriters in the, in the mortgage business as being the right balance, if you will, for that type of development. But, you know, it, it's, it's risk at every level. I mean, right. What's going on? I mean, it's all about traffic and foot traffic coming to this center to shop, to spend their three dollars for their latte or whatever. I mean, you know, nothing says that this change is going to do anything to the lot next door or to the one next to the high school. It, it's it's really, I mean, I, you know, again, I, I I wish we had this when I was involved in the lot next door because we were going to. We were going to borrow $1.7 million to do that. And to some degree, we've walked away saying, I'm glad it didn't happen because mm -hmm. we might be dealing with the building behind Rudy's at the moment and it could be vacant. Mm -hmm. not, just not a blank lot out there, it could be vacant. So 
it, it's, it's a tough, tough thing, but I, I like the diversity and the change in the housing mix that will come from this. And it's that foot traffic that I think will add some vibrancy to this downtown that we currently don't have. And, and just, it's, it's frustrating. And I, I, I hear everybody here and the passion that we each speak about with the town, not wanting to change and all these things. It, it, you know, again, nothing's going to guarantee anything here. But, uh, I, you know, I don't have the history with the comprehensive plan that, that Sarah and, and, and Anne has. But I, I just think at the end of the day, you know, I think that the planning board has spent hours studying this very same question. And we directed back through Maureen, where did the 3,000 come from? Yeah, that's you know, it. why wasn't it 5,500? Why wasn't it 4,800? I mean, there was no magic to it at all. So it's a bit, at one level, um, there's a bit of a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it's arbitrary. It seems rather oh. extreme, too. It, I mean, but it's, yet it's it, a big jump down. Well, <laughs> except that the 15 to 7,500, Sarah, is, is also extreme and was considered by people to be extreme. I, I just think that if you add that to the mix and, you, and we, 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 we pushed Maureen to go back and model this for us a couple, three times because it was too abstract. And when you applied that metric to these particular opportunities, it, it seemed okay. I, th I think I'm going to cut in as chair here because Sorry. it's 20 and 9 and we're on the first item. Um, so I think, we, I think we've really discussed the merits. It's been a really good discussion. Um, you know, I think we've pretty much got out all the arguments, uh, pro and con. So I'm going to call the question. The motion is to approve these amendments as laid out. Uh, so everyone in favor, please raise their hand. Five, opposed, two. The motion passes. Thank you very much. I, I must say in my years on the council, I think that's one of the best discussions on zoning ordinances I've ever heard. Everybody did a really good job on that one, so thank you. Okay, and now it's back to David Sherman. <laughs> this, this one probably won't take as long because we're just hopefully scheduling a public hearing, but right. I'm going to turn it over to Dave to, to just get a little bit of an overview and introduction so that we and the, and the citizens know what we're talking about. Certainly. It was only a month ago that the town council <laughs> referred the proposed uh, amendments, the agricultural amendments, uh, to the ordinance committee. The members of the ordinance committee then met four times uh, and with the tremendous uh, help of our town planner who accommodated all of our requests to meet at 7.30 in the morning on uh, those four weeks in a row, it was much appreciated. We also had participation uh, from Peter Hatem, the chair of the planning board, who was invaluable in giving us background on these proposed amendments, as well as uh, Chris Franklin from the Land Trust also uh, was a guest speaker. Uh, or participant in our, in our meetings. Uh, rather than duplicating the presentations as uh, I did the last time, I'm just going to turn it over to Maureen to sort of hit the high points of what we discussed and then I'll make a motion to refer this to a public hearing. Thank you. Back to you, Maureen. I promise I'll try to be very quick. This is very brief. <laughs> So here we are, back at the comprehensive plan. Um, I had talked before about packages of amendments. This is number three. Maybe we'll make it to five. Uh, so the comprehensive plan, again, was adopted in October. There were five packages. Uh, the, the agricultural amendments actually were two recommendations, and the Cape Farm Alliance very, very graciously and industriously jumped right on to the first one, which was create um, an agricultural profile for the town, and they put together a package of their recommendation of changes to the ordinance to implement our goals for agriculture. And this would be the third package you've got from the planning board. 
Uh, so this is the agriculture and forestry goal, 14 chapters. This chapter says that the town shall support the continuation of farming, management of woodland areas by working with farmers and landowners to provide for financial rewards and preservation of significant agricultural and forestry areas. So uh, 73 was the recommendation of the agricultural profile. Recommendation 74 reads as follows. Uh, basically review the town's regulations and look for any places where the town may have inadvertently been too inflexible and make it less di more difficult for, for farmers to make a living being farmers. Uh, and again, as, as Councillor swift Kayata mentioned earlier, there was uh, an, a public opinion poll, and in my opinion, the top three, 80% of the town supported preservation of farms, preservation of open space, preservation of significant natural areas. So this was the number one priority out of that, that poll. And we were looking very hard at trying to find ways to uh, try to preserve farms. So we looked at things like the minimum lot size that's required for a farm and fish market because if farmers can sell their produce themselves, they can cut out the middleman or as someone said the second middleman. Uh, looked at the regulations for temporary buildings. Were we, sending planning, were we sending farmers to the planning board for site plan review when we really didn't need to? So we looked at that. Uh, agriculture related accessory buildings and uses. You know, if you look at the history of farming, and I like reading the old articles about farming in Cape Elizabeth, farmers were extremely creative in finding ways to make money. Um, and, you know, they were shoveling the roads before we had plows, and this was kind of getting back to the whole, if a farmer can figure out something that they can do that will make them a little extra money and really is still consistent with the idea of farming, maybe we should look at trying to loosen that up so they can do it. Um, the agriculture definition, it was a little old. It just needed some updating, and so there's a brand new definition. And this whole idea of looking at agriculturally related products that farmers could sell. Again, another income stream. And then um, specifically the restriction on how much you could sell in your farm market that didn't come out of your farm fields. So uh, the amendments you have in front of you, there's a new agriculture definition. There is a three page list of a variety of agriculture definitions. The planning board picked one that they liked. Uh, they modified it a little. The ordinance committee reviewed it. They made some additional changes. There's a brand new type of use called an agriculture related use and there's a definition for that. Um, there's the whole issue of the farm market. Right now you can open a farm market and up to 25% of what you can sell in the farm market can be not related to your farm. And when you think about the growing season, uh, and your desire to attract customers to your farm market on a regular basis, there needs to be some predictability on what they're going to find when they go there. So the idea is, one, to allow farmers to supplement what they've got in their farm market with other things when their products aren't in season, and also to give them more opportunity to sell what we call the value-added products. If, if you're big into growing strawberries and you decide you want to do some canning and sell strawberry jam, the new, the new market for agricultural products really is in the product that's ready to go, not just the people who used to buy a bushel of, of strawberries and bring them home and can them themselves. So there was a big change in the farm market definition so that you can up to 50 percent of what you sell in the farm market can be farm related. It doesn't have to be stuff that's grown in the farm field. Also, uh, you can sell at your farm market anything that's grown in Cape Elizabeth. It doesn't just have to come from your farm. Uh, agriculture is now the agriculture related use, that flexible farmers being creative with other things they can do, is a permitted use in, in all the districts now. And um, it just has to be accessory to being a farmer. And then uh, we just overhauled the site plan standards to make it clear when temporary buildings needed site plan review and when they don't need site plan review. And that's all in there too. And I can go in more detail if you want or I can stop there. I, I think stopping there is at a good point. Um, do I hear a motion? Uh, sir, thank, and, thank you, Maureen. You're very welcome. Before I make my motion, I'm sitting next to a member of the Cape Farm Alliance, and I neglected to thank the members of the Cape Farm Alliance for all of their uh, hard work uh, on this uh, project as well. And I want to thank uh, uh, those members that showed up to all of our ordinance committee meetings. They were very, very helpful. Um, 
<coughs> I got a kick from under the table, so I was <laughs> duly prompted. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we refer the proposed agricultural amendments uh, to the next uh, meeting of the town council for a public hearing, which is May uh, May 10th. May 10th. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I hear no discussion. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, uh, Ordinance Committee. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Cape Farm Alliance. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, the next item has to do with the Municipal Open Space Management Plan. And uh, Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, and Councillor Sullivan have worked together to prepare a draft charge. Um, Jessica, do you want to introduce this one? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, yes, this is a draft charge to develop an open space and green belt management committee. Um, <clears throat> the charge reads to prepare for town council consideration a plan for management of, open, of town open space and green belt trails except for Fort Williams which already has an established management structure. The town of Cape Elizabeth now owns close to 10% of the total acreage of the town as open space with legal public access. Much of the land includes greenbelt trails. The open space and the trails are highly valued by town residents and significantly contribute to community character. Both the quantity of open space and the use of greenbelt trails have progressed to the level where, management, where a management plan is needed to cohesively guide the town and its stewardship responsibilities. Um, the Conservation Commission has been, you know, discussing this. The chair, the new chair is Dina DeSena, and as, as the town liaison um, to the um, commission, um, or the, I'm getting involved, getting involved with this, but anyhow, the basic idea is that we have a lot of different types of open space in the town. And there's a lot of use, there are conflicts of use, there are all kinds of people that want to use all the space we have, people that walk, ride their bikes, ride horses, that sort of thing. And so it's reached the point where uh, a management plan is a good idea. So that's what we're working on. Um, and, some, and we want to develop uh, such things as identification, classification, where is it, what, is it, what are the uses now, are there conflicts of the use and so forth and so on? This is a, uh, this type of plan actually, there are communities in the United States that have already developed this. It's very common in Europe, I found out doing research, because you know, their open space is a lot more limited than it is in the United States, and so they've had to deal with this. Um, and uh, so it's pretty exciting. Um, we're looking forward to it. We're waiting for our town charge so that to be approved so that we can start having meetings. So would you like to make a motion? I would. I would like to move that um, the town council accept the uh, draft authorization for the open space and green belt management committee. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? I just have a general question. Yes, Penny. Um, and this is more from, I guess, a procedural perspective. Because when I read this, I, within our council goals, I thought we had already kind of talked about this and authorized it. So I wondered why we needed to, to vote on this. If we already had a conservation commission, we have a council person who's uh, uh, the liaison with the commission. And um, I'm wondering if this is going to become the protocol for achieving our goals because in working with the Recycling Commission Committee, I just took it upon myself that here's our goal, here's our charge, are we willing to work on this together? Did I need to propose a, uh, I guess, a plan to be voted on by the council? Mike, do you want to address this? I'd, I'd be happy to. I'm a wicked process person. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, a general yeah, question. I think the, the difference is if you look at the, uh, the recycling and the paper throw, the council was pretty precise. This is what we want you to look at. An open space management plan, you know, what is that? And it, it was felt that it needed a little bit more, um, a little more description of what you really wanted. 
Uh, and, and it was also, there was a debate for a while, do we have the Conservation Commission do it, or do we have a separate working group do it, bringing in other parties and other groups? And the recommendation that's coming before you this evening really gives a, a, a little more heft to what's meant by an open space uh, green belt management plan. And it also specifically uh, designates the Conservation Commission. So, so the council is, in fact, providing specific direction uh, if you adopt this. Just, and I just, like, I, I just need to understand from an, a consistency perspective. So what that says is, um, as Frank Governale is working on our um, looking at all of the inventory of our buildings in town, mm -hmm. that as he comes up with, here's what I think, mm -hmm. how we want to proceed with that, it will come to the council for a vote versus come to the council for a workshop? No, in that instance, uh, Councilor Governale and, and I and others will, will work in the background, and then at some point, you know, some it will be preparing data and some recommendations will come forward to the council. Uh, there isn't a question of is there another committee that that should automatically go to uh, versus setting up another committee. Do you need a committee? It was just felt that an open space management plan, particularly, you know, after we had a few controversial issues uh, back last fall, it, it, there was a sense that there was really a need to, to give it a little bit more attention to make sure there were opportunities for public input and to, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a process that everyone understood what was going to be looked at. You know, I look at the, the Municipal Operations Review Committee, and even with the charge, that, that group, you know, certainly has its challenges. <laughs> and, you know, this group, it really lays it out, a vision, a, uh, this, this is what we really want, and it's... Specificity it's, is good. Yeah. I think it's good to have clear direction. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't disagree with this at all, and I'm, I'm going to vote for it, but yeah. it just seemed uh, like out of, out of context for me because I would have thought it would have been uh, at a workshop, here's how we're going to proceed with this versus yeah. having to vote on it. If I could interject, I think there's a variety of, of avenues that mm -hmm. these sort of initiatives or projects come to the council. Sometimes it's something like have the Fort Williams Advisory Commission just figure it out, the charge is, you know, one or two sentences. Um, and then other times there's a, a council committee with the council liaison working on something. Sometimes it's a citizen committee like the Alternative Energy Committee. Um, this happens to be a committee that is mostly the Conservation Committee. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, for one, I'll be supporting it too, like you, I guess. And I really appreciate the specificity of it because I think it, it helps give some direction um, on what the scope is. Sometimes the scope of these things the amorphous. can be amorphous <laughs> and sort of hard for the committee and hard for the council. And, you know, is it bigger than a bread box or what's it supposed to include? And so, so I appreciate this. Yeah, I just I'm needed glad so so I have a better sense of what it's about. And also in terms of greater the goal of better communication with citizens, I think by having this they have a better sense of what this is all about and what we're trying to achieve. So Mike. just follow up on what the, the chair has just said. The staff is really trying hard this year to have the goals keep coming before the council. If you look at your agenda this evening, I think you know, everything we've discussed so far relates to a council goal. And you know, every month when we look at preparing the council agenda, it is how are we advancing those council goals. And part of it is not only the, the end result of it, but also that everyone can see the progress that's being made. And by having these types of things come, we're hoping to accomplish that. I noticed that. And I'm very goal driven. So as I see those, I go, good job. Thanks, I just uh, want to give some uh, kudos to, our, again, our town planner. The, the first three items we've discussed on the agenda tonight have all been the result of a lot of her hard work and dedication. And a lot of folks send me emails like, well, gee, what's the town planner doing now that the economy has slowed down? Well, if you look <laughs> at what we've been discussing so far tonight, it's uh, largely a result of her efforts and her hard work. And she has given me and other members of the Ordinance Committee, and I'm sure Jessica mm -hmm. Sullivan, mm -hmm. a lot of good input, a lot of good information that has made our job a lot easier. So I want to thank you, Maureen, again, for your, for your good work. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. On behalf of all of us, thank you. So. 
and thank you for mentioning that. I had, it doesn't, I had one comment on the chart itself. Um, number three, hunting. I don't know if, if um, am I correct that there's no discharge of firearms allowed in town? Is that correct? Uh, you're not correct. Okay. In fact, I, don't ask me why, why but I, I read the firearms ordinance this afternoon. Uh, there is, okay, I won't ask you there, why. <laughs> we do allow the discharge of firearms uh, over saltwater marshes okay. uh, well, on I federal asked. property and at the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Okay, well, I'm glad I asked because and, I would... And, and if a farm a has identified that there has been destruction to crops. Correct. Okay. That was in it. That's a separate paragraph. Oh. <laughs> Sure. The, fire, the Rod and Gun Club, is that going to be considered under this, or is that not open? No, the, true you. Sorry. Uh, no, and there's also a state law that has since come in that said the town cannot regulate uh, uh, shooting ranges. It, the, we've been, the we've been preempted. It's private. The state has pre, it's a private association. The state has preempted municipalities from regulating local outdoor firing ranges. Sort of, sort of like cell tower, the federal cell tower regulations. Um, but I would just ask, I don't know if we want to formally add this to the number three, hunting, but um, I would say hunting, firearm discharge, bow hunting, and fishing. I'd, I'd sort of work all those into there, because those are all things that can happen in open space, and I'd like to see those addressed by this committee. So if we could just add, add those firearms discharge targets, uh, I'm sorry, bow hunting and fishing. Done. So Thank you. So do, I, do we need to Can I propose that as an amendment? I forgot. Will you it. accept that? It, did somebody? Jessica yes. made, she made it. I made the motion. <laughs> yeah, the original one. I'm doing a great job. <laughs> Who's in charge here? I don't know. I don't know. You need somebody to know what's going on. That's probably yes. nice. I, okay. I accept, accept that. It. Yes. And who seconded? I did. And, and I accept that. It's great. Okay. <laughs> great. So we have uh, an amended motion before us. Anybody else have anything? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I thought we were going to give Maureen a break. I don't know if she has to say anything about this. But um, our next item is item number 45, which has to do with the, uh, the boat storage racks at Great Pond. Do you want to introduce this, Mike? First, I'd like to thank the Conservation Commission for their exceptional work uh, in uh, constructing these boat storage racks. Yes, they did work with Maureen as well on this. And, you know, as, as was discussed in January, uh, you know, this all comes about as a result of the Spray Corporation uh, looking to be better stewards of their property uh, in terms of protecting the, the, the Great Pond and not having boats attached to trees and all over the place. And back in January, the, the Sprague's uh, Corporation indicated that the town uh, could, on Sprague property, uh, erect uh, boat racks to serve up to 30 boats. And Deborah Lane and Maureen have been working on a permitting system uh, for that. Letters are ready to go out, uh, just awaiting the town council establishing a fee for the storage of the boats. Uh, we probably will be back to you sometime uh, later in the year uh, for perhaps some ordinance language if people don't re remove their boats when they're supposed to, of how that's dealt with and how that's paid for. Uh, because we do have concerns with uh, folks still re leaving boats there and uh, uh, having the teeth to be able to do something about it. So I would encourage you to adopt this in the proposed $20 fee uh, with the proceeds to go into a general ledger fund, uh, which means that all of the money set aside uh, would go towards uh, support of uh, future repairs to the boat racks, replacement of them, as well as for the cost of decals and other related expenses. Thank you, Mike. Is there a motion? Jessica? Yes, I make a motion to uh, accept uh, the town manager's proposal for the $20 uh, storage fee, annual storage fee for a boat at uh, the boat racks. Second. Okay. Is there discussion? And that includes that the, f the fees would then be uh, allocated or dedicated to support the boat storage program? Is that part of the motion? Is that part of your motion? 
Yes, that the that uh, as per the town manager, that the funds collected for the uh, annual boat storage will be designated to a, uh, a specific account, allowing that money to grow, so that funds will be used as needed to repair the boat wrecks. Okay, great. And this is outlined in his memo of April first in mm -hmm. more detail. Okay. So it's been moved. I'm sorry. Was it seconded? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, is there discussion? I have a bunch of questions, but Mike, you kind of implied that all the administrative nuances haven't been worked through, so would you rather not go through all my questions? I don't know what your questions are. <laughs> Here we go. Are you if ready? If you're comfortable that you think they'll be covered later, uh, you can give them to me later. We'll, uh, but if, you, if my, this one you're my, dying to ask, One of ahead. my third question was, what if boats are left behind? Uh, how are we going to ensure that only 30 boats are down there? Who's going to be going down and making sure none are sitting on the mm -hmm. ground? Uh, who do people see in order to get their little tags? Um, how do we ensure that Cape Elizabeth's end of the agreement is upheld? Who's the overseer of that? And uh, is it going to be a notice on the rack? Uh, the boat rack to say who do I contact if I want to have my boat here? I can quickly answer those questions. <laughs> Uh, Jordan, all the, the town clerk is the permitting authority. Uh, there's 27 of the 30 racks have already been called for, uh, have already been requested. The, the original number of 30 was based on the number of boats that had been originally stored there. Uh, if boats are stored there without permission, it's our intent to have the Department of Public Works remove them and to have a police officer present at the time to witness and photograph. Uh, the actual removal of the boat so that there's no sense of theft <coughs> by the So is somebody going to go down there periodically to make sure that... Uh... Uh, we're not going to go down there every day, but if, we, you know, upon complaint, we'll go down. And okay. We'll go down from time to time. Okay. Uh, but, you know, we do, we do feel as though we, we're going to need something that people just don't think Public Works is going to take away their boat during the winter and store it for them. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> And is there going to be a sign? There will be. There is a sign all prepared and ready to go with a nice green belt sign on it. All right. Well, geez, that worked out. It worked okay, out. Jessica. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the volunteers with the Conservation Commission. Um, as the new liaison, I've gone for open space management. I've attended the last several Conservation Commission uh, meetings, and there is a group of incredibly dedicated and talented volunteers. Mike Duddy was the crew chief of this effort to build these uh, racks. Also Dick Bauman, John Mehefka, Marty Blair, Dina DeSena, Brendan Stewart, who's an Eagle Scout candidate, Frank Miles, and Ryan, and I don't know Ryan's last name. But um, if you haven't had a chance to go down and see these, there are, there are photos um, on the website. But it's quite impressive, and I think it's an incredible start to what I hope is a really great solution for this situation down there. Great. I'd like to move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Um, item number 46, downed tree policy on municipal property. Right? Yeah, with, with all the recently downed trees, uh, we, we discovered that the, the town council policy relating to how to deal with downed trees did not properly adhere to the conservation ordinance, Chapter 18 of the revised official code of the town of Cape Elizabeth, and specifically in that it gave uh, the, the, the town's down tree policy gave certain responsibilities to the uh, town planner when in fact the ordinance had reserved them for the tree warden. So we'd like to have the policy uh, conform with the existing ordinance and have the tree warden uh, fulfill his responsibilities in uh, carrying out the town council policy and the tree ordinance as it relates to the, the protection of uh, the uh, municipal forest. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? Sarah? I move we adopt the down tree policy on municipal property as set before us in our packets. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is, are there any questions or does anybody have any? Suggestions on the wording. I just wanted to thank Maureen for doing the revised draft for me. <laughs> Maureen, you've been working hard. I, I just, who is it? the tree warden? Uh, it's uh, Thomas Nee, and he reports to the director of public works. Okay, thank you. I have just a quick little question. Uh, the, first que the first statement about uh, residents are encouraged to report trees down on town trails to the town. 
who do, who's the town? Is it the town manager, the town clerk, or the... Well, does it go to the, 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 pl the best place to call is public works, but, okay. you know, citizens don't need to worry. Wherever they call, we'll make sure that the tree okay. warden is notified. So it's yeah. the town. It's the town. The town. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a couple of small things. I hope they're small. Um, uh, under number one, the last sentence in number one, it says if it talks about the town may contract out tree removal on town trails. If an abutting homeowner would like to help out and remove trees on trails, their contribution is appreciated. I wasn't sure perhaps we should modify that just to say if an abutting homeowner would like to help out and with the permission from, with permission from the town remove trees on trails, their contribution is appreciated. Because I wasn't sure, I mean, this sort of sounded like, I'm going to go help out and just cut some trees. And I wasn't sure if the intent was no. they needed to get permission or they could just cut up trees. If, if, if Just checking. We very much want individuals, when trees fall, to let us know. And no one is allowed to cut any trees on town property without permission of the tree warden. The, 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 ord, the, the ordinance that so overrides this is, is pretty emphatic. So should we state that to say with permission from the town or from the tree warden or something? Well, did, I'm not trying to be technical, did, but... I, I'm just trying to look at the... Yeah. Look, my copy on my laptop was messed up, but, but here it says upon request of the tree warden, a homeowner may volunteer to remove the tree. Does that, uh, is that my that's in, the same in number place? two. Oh, you're looking at number three. I'm I'm, no, I'm looking at number one. Okay. I haven't gotten to number two yet. No. Shouldn't it be just fallen trees? Removed? Yes, I, this I, is I, trees three. down on trails. Right. Um, my point, I won't go through the exact language, but my point in number one is it, perhaps the intent is that if a tree is down across the trail, we just want people to cut them up. But if our intent is that we want them to just notify us or ask permission, can I cut that tree? If we want them to do that, we should say that in the ordinance. We've had a couple of instances of trees that <clears throat> allegedly came down in storms, and when we go out and look at it, there's an interesting cutting pattern that belies something else. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the council's concerns. I'd like to suggest that maybe you might want to table this uh, so that those concerns uh, be adequately addressed, and we'll come up with Bef some language that uh, before anybody tables concerns it, don't table yet. Yeah, because I just wanted to say I think that with the permission of the town thing or notification should be under number two, and I don't know if our policy wants to talk about penalties for removing trees without permission. There is already a, pe a penalty provision in the tree, okay. in the conservation ordinance. But I do think that if someone looks at this independently, I, I, I am totally sympathetic to what's being said. Is I think it needs to be spelled out. I'm just a little nervous about trying to. Words write the words, right wordsmithing it without having looking at the ordinance at the same time. That's fine with me. If anybody else wants to make a comment before this is tabled, or if you have any further comments, do they, should they address them to you, Mike? Who I don't know who drafted uh, this. Is this a Maureen thing? Yeah, Maureen's got Bob, the draft. No? Yeah. Maureen, good. Okay, I'll uh, accept another motion right now. Okay, to uh, move to table this. Okay, is there a second? To the okay. next meeting. To the next meeting. To the yes. next. Uh, there, the next it's been meeting. moved and seconded to table this matter, this item, to the next meeting. There's no discussion next allowable. Meeting. The next regular meeting. Um, there's no discussion allowable on uh, motions to table. So all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Here's one I look forward to every year. Item number 47, the alewife regulations. Michael, you want to say anything? Or do we not need to say anything? Uh, Maureen had nothing to do with this one. <laughs> <laughs> These are the rules that have been adopted each year. It simply changes the date from 2009 to 2010. And in case anybody wonders, this is per a state mandate that we're supposed to have. And alewi alewives are little fish, for anybody who doesn't. I didn't know what that was. Before. We did. We, we have had a recent running of the ale alewives, and they were not at all plentiful. Oh, OK. Anybody want to make a motion? I'd like Jim. to move that we accept the uh, alewife regulations as reported by the town manager to the town council. 
Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none. Just a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Does this mean? Sorry. Is this regulated by the state that we have to allow them to be fished? Uh, we have to have regs. About we, we, Why don't we just say no fishing alewife if they're there? I thought they were like endangered, and we're trying to like shore up their ecosystem. This is to maintain them. But if you read this provision, you can scoop no. them up in buckets. Yeah, it's it's for like a couple. <laughs> no, it's, it's just the opposite. It's, it's, there's been an attempt to reestablish alewives as a harvestable fishing resource. That would, that's the intent of state policy. And that's because? Uh, because uh, to help out the commercial fishing industry, uh, particularly because of the use of alewives as, uh, as bait for other fish. But you find in Cape Elizabeth this really doesn't, isn't heavily fished? It, it, for you, yeah. It, it, it's, not, it's not heavily fished, but if you don't adopt an alewife regulation each year, you lose the right eventually to harvest them. And by, by adopting this, it does give the right to harvest them. It, the only place we have alewives is down on Alewife Farm, and Jody Jordan is the only one that could conceivably, would, or his family would be the only one to harvest the alewives. Thank you. It's a good one. Okay, that's uh, enough on alewives. <laughs> no, we didn't vote. Okay, all in favor. I guess I assumed that was the unanimous one, and it is. Thank you. Um, Battery Blair, item number 48, Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Is, uh, I see some Fort Williams Advisory Commission folks here. Are we um, getting an introduction from them or? When I spoke to Chuck Wilson, uh, who's here from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, as the chief spokesperson today, the indication was that he and Lois would be here. Uh, who's the, who's the co-chair of the Charitable Foundation? Yes, to answer any questions that you might have. Acting President. Acting President. Okay. So do you want a motion? Let's have a motion then. <laughs> Lois Carlson? Yeah. I didn't say Carlson? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that I was I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're locally famous, Ms. Carson. Do I hear a motion? Sarah? I move that we adopt the uh, request for private, fun for private funding for a study from, um, given to us by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission about Battery Blair, as described in our packet. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded. Uh, is there discussion? I, I just want to make sure I understand okay. the motion. We're authorizing the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to request private funding for the study. Yes. Okay. So this would not be then town dollars being requested. It, it just okay. gives them the authority to go seek the private funding. Yes. Entities associated with the town, town boards and commissions are not allowed to do fundraising without council permission. Okay. Any Further questions? I guess I have a question, and I guess it deals with the Commission's uh, charter and priorities. Uh, given our discussion at um, the beginning of the year regarding the need for addressing deferred maintenance at, at the fort, uh, the issue with the, uh, the mansion, uh, I'm just, uh, I guess, uninformed as it relates to this taking priority over these other things, which seems to me fairly urgent. And I don't know if we make the, the, the commission, uh, particularly Chuck, is working on a long-range maintenance plan. He's, he did a draft at the beginning of it a few weeks ago and then smartly left for Florida. Uh, <laughs> but they are, they are working on it, uh, the long-range maintenance plan. And this actually, this battery blast study you've been working on for over a year, Chuck? Two. If, if you could, I'm sorry, Chuck, if you could just come up so everybody could hear. Chuck Wilson. Chuck Wilson. Chuck Wilson. I was chair for two years of the, of the uh, advisory commission and uh, done a number of other things in town over the years. Uh, this battery blare piece, we started a study uh, almost three years ago where we hired some uh, Renner Woodworth to look at the guarded mansion, uh, the bleachers, uh, the bunkers or the batteries, uh, primarily garage and key, keys and, and battery player to see if there was what we needed to be doing or if we could do something with them to uh, try to preserve the, 
the real history of the fort, which is military, uh, and, and tie it in with the lighthouse and the lighthouse museum. And we, we essentially ruled out Battery Garache because it's too far away, uh, although it's, it's sort of open at this point. Uh, and we decided that Battery Blair really has some benefit to tie it in with the lighthouse and for make another attraction for people to go to and perhaps be able to get some federal money to do some of this. So we did an initial couple of test borings and did an initial study and the engineers told us that in order for us to go uh, file for grants or, or federal money, we needed quite a bit more engineering information. And so they presented us with a, a cost of about thirty grant thirty six thousand dollars to get there and that would put us in a position to be able to go to uh, foundations what have you and say we want to open this up and make it a visitor's attraction uh, and so what we're essentially saying is we'd like to go forward with that we went to the charitable foundation and said we don't have any town dollars to put into this could you take the leadership here and raise this money? They came back and said, <coughs> we will uh, pledge half of it and we'll raise the other half. Uh, and so what, what we're asking at this point is permission to go forward with that and have the <coughs> commission help the, uh, go perhaps do some soliciting with them so that they have people who can explain to the people who might write the check, what it is we're trying to do, what's the details involved, and where we're going. This isn't going to take away from any of the other things that we're doing. Uh, you're clearly, you're correct. There are some things that have uh, a higher priority to be done, but this is probably a five-year process just to get ourselves to a position where we may be able to do something. Uh, uh, my guess is it'll be perhaps 10, and then we might be, we might really be at an opening of something that could be really fantastic for the fort. But the other things are still, we're still working on. We're actively working on what we think the needs are cost-wise. We're going to break them down for you. So, you know, tax dollars, uh, uh, private funds, or what have you, so we can, we can have a spreadsheet for you, hopefully, I, I think uh, this coming meeting we're dealing on trying to deal with the thoughts of how to raise money in the end, but we'll, we're trying to do both of them at the same time. So maybe that answers your question. Frank? Uh, yeah, so um, just so I'm clear on this. So you may engage in uh, fundraising for this. That's correct. But work on this will not precede other work that has been done in the park, both the mansion or the uh, deferred maintenance. Is that correct? Uh, the money to raise the, to do this study would be spent, but we're not going to do any construction or anything of that nature until we, once we get the study done and say, okay, this is what it involves, we're expecting that it's probably going to be a million to a million and a half dollars to accomplish it, but it's not going to come from tax dollars. It's going to come from somewhere else. But, e but even if, it, even if uh, it all came from somewhere else, that work wouldn't occur before other work on the park that we've talked about? Uh, I wouldn't say that, no. It might occur simultaneously. Uh, hopefully, it wouldn't detract from our ability to get funds for, for the other things. And if it starts to be that kind of an issue, then this one may have to be 10 or 15 years instead of five. Mike? No, I, I just want to really thank the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation uh, for this. The, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has been very involved in the study as of members of the Charitable Foundation. And the Charitable Foundation has agreed, as I understand it, to really help lead the fundraising. And the, the real reason this is before the, the uh, council is, you know, if they're to raise money for a major project, they need to come to the council. But in addition, they want to work with members of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to go make some visits to some folks who may be interested in, in actually making some contributions to this. And, uh, you know, really appreciate 
the charitable foundation's willingness to do this and to work so closely with the advisory commission yeah, in, is, in making some of those visits. This is really a great thing. I mean, the, the charitable foundation has stepped up in this particular case to really lead this, um, and it's, it's, it's an exciting possibility for us to accomplish something. So the foundation has expressed a specific interest in this specific project? They feel this is something that they can really sell and it will really long term do good things for the poor. Great. Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Um, I've lost track again. Do we, we must we have, have a motion. motion in a second. Yeah. Okay, yes. anything else? All in favor? It's unanimous. And I do want to um, echo Mike's thanks to the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation and to the Sub Blair, um, what was it, the Battery Blair Planning Subcommittee, as well as the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. So. And, and I want to thank Bob Malley, Bob who's Malley. not here. Uh, uh, Maureen had nothing to do with this. It, uh, <laughs> it was Bob. She she must, will. She's resting on her laurels. She'll right be going to Florida. She'll be Maureen, right next. Started strong tonight, nope, Maureen, Bob but had, you're uh, lagging. went now. to all the meetings of the Battery Blair Committee and has worked very closely with, uh, with the groups. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on, item number 49, having to do with a revaluation or equalization in town. Mr. Sturgis, the town assessor. That's true. Well, good evening. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, on my way in tonight, I was thinking uh, just really to understand where we are, we need to know our history. And it couldn't be more appropriate than thinking about the project that we're about to undertake with a revaluation. Uh, with that being said, the last revaluation was performed in 2000, well, for fiscal year 2004 at a cost of approximately $37,300. Uh, at the time, the ratio went from 59% of market value to 100% of market value. And the ratio, for those of you not first in assessor jargon, is really the relationship of the assessment to sale price. And so I look at that fairly closely in this good range of understanding where we sit overall, where properties sit in relationship to where the, what they're assessed for. Um, in 2004, the municipal value went from $763 million to, a pro to just over uh, $1,255,000,000. And the tax rate at the same time went from $22.64 to $14.20. Uh, the reason why I, I try to get that across is because the desired impact of an equalization is really to balance the tax burden and not... Uh, it, not to raise new funds. A revaluation is ultimately revenue neutral. Uh, the council makes the decisions as to what we spend. If you think about a big fraction, and that's the top number, and the bottom number is the value of the town. So uh, LD1 being what it is and other financial concerns that, that, that you make is, is in your, is in your uh, what you say, your, your realm of influence, whereas my number on the bottom is the overall value of the town. So. As the bottom number increases, then thus the, you know, the, the, the mill rate decreases. And I just want to let folks know that when you do a revaluation, it's not a method of increasing revenues for the town or for the school or for whatever it can be turned into, but more or less just a way of making sure that folks are being treated fairly and equitably as far as their assessment goes in relationship to the neighbor and the neighbor across town. Uh, the current assessed value for the town is $1,345,000,000. That's the local assessment, not to be confused with state valuation. And our assessment ratio is approximately 78% of market value. Now, when you think about that, the state minimum says set, when you drop below 70%, that's one of the triggers for revaluation. The other trigger is a quality rating of 20, which is really a way of understanding the equity across the board in assessment. And you think about that 78%, you say, well, that sounds pretty good. Um, and it sounds okay. However, when you, you start to go below the surface and one examines the different neighborhoods in town, uh, ultimately you found that they find that there's a diversity in the ratios throughout the different towns. And overall, uh, I've broken the town into 16 different markets, uh, 16 different sub-neighborhoods, and looked at that. and. 
they looked at their ratios over the years, uh, every year, sometimes more than five or six times a year, just to see where we were going, especially in light of the most recent run-up in values that took place up until about a year and a half ago to two years ago. But the range in assessment ratios went from 60% for a low to about 84% of a high. And about two-thirds of the properties really ranged between 73% and 84%. And that's really, you know, that's, that's the difference that makes a revaluation necessary, ultimately. Uh, quite simply, it's saying that some property owners are paying more than their share, and other property owners are paying less than their fair share. And um, this property is really, I mean, this project will work towards leveling that relationship. So uh, neighbors won't be having those disparities between their assessments, and uh, it'll, it'll make Sunday coffee time a little bit more peaceful, hopefully, when they go to one of the local cafes. Uh, in 2004, what I ended up doing was, <laughs> sorry, uh, it was all that land use talk earlier. Uh, <laughs> in 2004, <laughs> we revisited <laughs> we revisited approximately every property in town. We went to every address physically and looked at that and verified the data that we had, corrected errors that existed, picked up what, what we may not have received. Uh, and the current assessments that we have right now that our property tax bills are based on are based on that data. Uh, at this point in time, there's a high level of confidence in the data. You know, we go through, we monitor property, uh, uh, sorry, building permit data that comes through. We go through and take a look at that, pick up decks, take off decks that have been deleted, uh, make the adjustments as necessary as you go along on an annual basis over the past seven years. So that's how ultimately we went from the one. 255 to 1345 where we picked up or in, within the past seven years the town has increased in approximately 90 million dollars in value just based on new construction that's taken place in town so I think that there's a high level of confidence in the data that we have now based on that confidence I don't think that we need to go out and spend all that money to go and look at every property again and hire a lot of field people so we can make a lot of the adjustments in-house so to speak uh, an electronic update is what I'm proposing. Uh, I'll still have to go out into the field, and I do that anyways on a monthly basis, but this would be a little bit more intensive to go out and look at the sales data or look at the houses that have sold and take a visit and make sure that the information that I do have on the card is accurate. So when I use those sales in performing my analysis, then I can say, okay, I know this is right, and the sales data, you know, like say it sold for $250,000 and I have it assessed for $175,000. I can say, well, it wasn't because I missed a 24 by 40 addition. It was just an increase in the market value that took place from 2004 to today. Um, so basically I'll use that data and other analysis of the sales that take place and work towards updating the land values that we have in town to the current values. Uh, as well as updating our cost tables for construction values and all along testing those results. So if I end up looking at, you know, I have a land value established for a new neighbor, for a neighborhood that's a newer value and I take in my new cost tables and price out that building, then I'll look at that new assessed value and test it against what it sold for. And basically you perform that over and over again so you can make sure that what you're doing is, is, is backed up within the data that's out there. And after testing and retesting and throwing out the bad and keeping the good, uh, ultimately we'll go to, go to press or make those changes and implement the whole revaluation system into uh, computer uh, assisted mass appraisal system. Now this project will take the better part of a year uh, and it's estimated that I will have values updated and notices mailed out next May, which is about the same time as we did it the last time. Uh, I'll hold uh, our hearings with all the property owners that come in to have questions or want to just, you know, from asking, verifying the information to just kick in the tires, so to speak, and find, trying to just find out and be informed uh, through, through May and into early June, and I'll have finalized values ready for our normal time for commitment, which is towards, ultimately, towards the end of July. Um, so the values that will be changing will be for the fiscal year 2012 which means tax bill for 2011, October, and April 2012. 
Uh, the cost of this project is ultimately going to be $19,000 or less because that's what we have budgeted. Uh, and I know I, I have a high confidence level that I, I can do it for that amount. Uh, it, the buck really comes down to me and uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in doing that. Uh, we, we had this all lined up to do in 2008 and because of the way the numbers were going, when you think about it, our ratio at that time was about 66% of market value and we've been trending up towards closer to 78 to 80. So within that basic two year period, we gave back about 12% of value, but still the equity issues have existed. And I wanna make sure that uh, it's understood that the biggest thing and the biggest reason driving behind this revaluation is ultimately to make sure that properties in different sections, sections of town are being fairly assessed and equitably assessed. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Matt? Frank? Just two questions. Uh, first, what's the, since it's being done in house, what's the money used for that you have allocated for it? And second, have we done this type of um, electronic update before? Will equalization? Before? What's the history on it? I can say that generally Cape Elizabeth has done them uh, large scale in the past. I think the, the one before me was a large scale one in 90, 94, and it had been almost nine years, almost 10 years to the, between them. So those were both large scale projects. Um, Again, before that one, I believe the one before that I think was done in house electronically by Jerry Daigle. Um, it was like an in, it's, it's almost like an intermediate step uh, in order to kind of level the playing field in many ways, especially if you have done something fairly recently and versus like the town or some towns can go a long time. If, ultimately, a lot of towns may look at it if you have a really stable period, like say like 1990 to about 2003 was a pretty stable period, really, for residential real estate in the state of Maine. Uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot of growth because it went through a couple of downturns and upturns, but overall the balance was fairly strong from 03 to uh, beyond it took off. So many towns have done it more recently. So if you've done something fairly recent, and I think seven years is, you know, it goes by pretty fast, but I do think that uh, as far as the data goes, there hasn't been enough substantial changes to have to go out and do something like that. Um, so at this point in time, in-house like that, electronic would be appropriate. As far as what the money would be spent on, postage is a big, uh, a big number that has to go out there. I may have to hire um, an, an occasional consultant to help out. We do have a couple of properties. I am a uh, certified general appraiser, which ultimately allows me to put values on all classes and values of property in the state. However, uh, there are 4,300 properties, and I'd like to make you know, the best use of that time. So I think those are two of the larger areas of that. Um, we may, I may end up hiring uh, potentially a temporary person to help as far as scheduling appointments during that time period. It's a fairly large crush when you send out 4,300 notices of increase in value to a town. The phones are fairly busy for a little while. So we had, uh, during the last review, uh, we had a, a lady that worked, was working in our office and we extended her for a year actually to help us get through that time period. So those would be the, the larger areas of, uh, of expense. What is your expectation about the outcome? Do you think that there are sections of town that are going to go up and others down? Or do you think it's houses sprinkled around town? I'm just trying to anticipate the reaction of the community. I mean, is it uh, you know, shoreland property going up, backland property not? Just I'm not looking for specifics here. Yeah, no, no, I think it's a great question. I think yes to both. <coughs> I'm not trying to be cute. Uh, I do think that there are, I know specifically there are segments of town that as a whole really felt appreciation greater so than other neighborhoods in town did. So you're looking at land values that maybe in, the, in one section, 03, 04, were maybe around $85,000 is what I might have used for base value on, on their lots, like on a standard, let's say, one point eight four acre uh, lot size and from that point to now they might be going up to like let's say hundred and thirty thousand dollars is what they may be worth so that's a fairly substantial increase whereas in other parts of town you know they might have been you know houses may have been selling in that neighborhood for say three hundred fifty thousand dollars and now they're selling for say three hundred and sixty five so there hasn't been a great amount of growth um, it's just the vagaries of the market. I just want to try to make sure that reflects it. But there may be, and, there, and to be honest, there's uh, other properties, and you, you look at that, and 
you don't just, I mean, you can't really just go and instant reval somebody because, hey, you got one by me. Um, but I know where uh, I have other, let's say, issue properties that I look at in town, I'm like, what the heck was I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, hindsight's 2020, but I can't go back and say, you know what, I'm going to cherry pick this because it's not really, uh, I think I'm going to get, I think you get challenged. We end up, with, <laughs> end up with a larger legal expense that year, to be honest, and I don't think I'd win. Thank you. I have one question. Um, just so people know, uh, you talked about visiting properties. When you, when the assessor visits a property, I mean, what, is it, what does that mean? Do you just go look at the outside? Do you look at the inside? Do you make an appointment? Just, just so people have a sense of what that means. Yeah, well, uh, with Cape being, uh, Cape Elizabeth being primarily, uh, you know, majority of folks work out of town. Uh, it's tough, but what uh, what I end up doing, I, I wear my badge, somebody's there, and uh, you know, I always introduce myself as to what and who I am, what I'm there for. I don't, uh, like we have all kinds of properties, well I had a number of properties, I'd say probably in 2004 I did about 1500, 1500 reviews myself. I think I had three uh, refusals to enter. It doesn't really, I mean, so, that's do you, the, that's so do you make right. an appointment, or do you just go knock on the door? At that point, we were knocking on the door. This time, we're talking about 300 properties. What I'm thinking of doing would be a good approach would be to send a letter and just say, you know, there's a questionnaire you can send out. Uh, some of my associates in other towns have used that. And then say, you know, if, if you'd like to have me schedule an appointment, I'd be happy to come over and take a look at it. A lot of the stuff I can learn is from the outside. Um, a lot of a lot of property record updating that takes place in this town is done when we do uh, a building permit and we'll go in for like a certificate of occupancy and uh, do a review at that point in time. If someone doesn't want me to go into their property, uh, I, I don't take offense at that. I'm very comfortable with what they don't want me to do. Uh, I'm not going to penalize them for me not getting into their property, uh, to be honest. I mean, it's all I want to do is make sure that the record's accurate. And it's in, probably in their best interest to have it be accurate because if, if you are on the outside, generally the outside is going to be reflective of the inside. That being said, if one was to go and look at the Viking today and look at the outside and he went onto the inside, it would be two different worlds because the inside has what was the inside all on the floor now. So, uh, you know, you have to do that with some, some conservatism, but you know, I, I kind of take a more modern approach to assessing that some of my predecessors in the field may not have taken, uh, where they would take a little bit harder line approach to that and be like, oh, you barred your right to appeal. No, you're not barred your right to appeal. It doesn't say that in the state law. Uh, and you don't have to let me in. It doesn't say that in the state law. I generally just try to go and do what I can do for the best to make sure that I'm treating that property fairly and equitably in accordance with them. So. Uh, if somebody wasn't there and I happen to go there on the outside, I have a stack of door hangers about this thick that we just put on the doorknob and say, I was there because neighbors talk. You know, somebody's going to be home in the neighborhood. They're going to see some guy in a silver truck uh, <laughs> who's going to be leaving something on their doorknob and uh, it has my phone, you know, has the town's phone number on it and has the information. So hopefully if they have questions and I mean, it's not, like I say, it's not going to 4,500 properties or 4,300 properties. It's going to about 300. Okay. If that, is that helpful? That's, and, that answers my question. Thank you. I just want to say one other quick thing. Sure. Uh, just a thanks to Penny. I had a good conversation with her, her this morning. And we finally got a chance to touch base, and she kind of uh, gave me some good questions. I didn't mean to steal her thunder, but she did give me some good uh, thoughts in preparation for tonight's presentation. So much obliged. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for that review. Is there a motion? Hey, somebody's got to make a motion. Dave. I'll try. <laughs> uh, I move that we begin a revaluation program with the revised revaluation totals to be utilized with the taxes due beginning in October 2011. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. I moved and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next is item number 50, which has to do with a crosswalk from Broadcove Road to Rudy's. 
Mike? Yes, it, as part of the recent review of uh, the site plan of Rudy's, they were hoping to, to make some changes down there. Uh, they received a shared parking agreement with St. Bartholomew's Church. Uh, as part of the discussion, the planning board required uh, the owner of Rudy's to install a crosswalk across Route 77 going towards St. Bartholomew's. There's a couple of problems with that proposal, uh, with, with that uh, decision. Uh, one is that the Maine Department of Transportation only allows crosswalks with the speed limit is 35 miles per hour, and the speed limit in that particular section is 40 miles per hour. An additional problem is that crosswalks are supposed to attach to sidewalks, and there's really no sidewalk on the other side. So we'll put this on the agenda, uh, suggesting that you, know, you may want to ask MDOT if they're willing to reduce the speed limit in that section. They did look at it within the last year and said no, uh, but what, what would happen is you, you would either request this or uh, you would decide not to and then I would simply write to the planning board saying that the town council decide not to and Rudy's would then, the owner of Rudy's, would also write to the board uh, and simply say that, uh, you know, that, that it's an unattainable uh, condition and the, the planning board uh, with no doubt would vacate it since it's unattainable. So the choice before you is to request uh, the state to review the speed limit or to uh, not request the state to do it. And, and if so, uh, you know, Rudy's w would still be able to go forward probably because we're pretty confident the planning board uh, would vacate that condition. I'm going to ask if there are any questions for Mike before we have a motion. Frank and then Sarah. So, Mike, if they, if, if we go through the procedures and they don't uh, put a uh, crosswalk in, does that prevent them from doing the parking lot swap at St. Park? No, no, it doesn't. We'd just ask the planning board to vacate the specific condition for the crosswalk. So the only, the only real issue then is, I mean, substantive issue is, is it going to be unsafe for people to cross 77 without the crosswalk? No. Or sure. reverses, is it incrementally safer to have a crosswalk? It's the, the planning board debated that and decided that they wanted to have a crosswalk. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Sarah? Um, when MDOT was looked at it within a year, did they specifically look at that area? I thought they were more focused right here on the town center. Did they looked at the whole uh, Route 77 from Scarborough to South Fork? And did they specifically say, in this particular area, we do not want to reduce it, or was it more of a gestalt, we just don't want to change it? They indicated that there was only one small area right below the town center here where they'd consider changing the speed limit. So they looked at every section? They looked at every section. Jim? And is it the town policy to have a crosswalk to a sidewalk, or is that a state or a? It, it, it's, a, it's, a state, it's a state requirement based on the, the uniform uh, uh, construct the MUTCD, the, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Uh, and, you know, in the case, for example, if you look at the Key Bank one, we actually installed a little sidewalk right. uh, in order, because it was clearly a crosswalk. The high school, we didn't have to, because we, we, we referred to it as a bike crossing. That was for, it was for folks that were riding their bikes to school. Yes, so that's that why there's none, no sidewalk on this side that it attaches to. Then, yeah. And if the planning board put this as a requirement on the on the Rudy's um, approval, approval, why wouldn't they have required as an off street improvement for them to build whatever sidewalk was required to complete this provision? You know, the the, the planning board spent an awful lot of time on this issue. Uh, you know, had a lot lot of discussion, and sometimes. Uh, you know, in the end, they, 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 they may not be fully aware of all the conditions as they, they weren't in this case, so they, they did not require it. Okay. Were there neighbors that were particularly interested in having a crosswalk located in this place? I think it was mainly coming from the planning board. Okay. I, just I, being a resident of Broad Cove, I have mm -hmm. often thought, because there are a lot of neighborhood kids walk out Broad Cove Road and cross 77 to get to Rudy's or or the prior business establishments, and I've often thought of 
crosswalk would be a great idea, and I've heard other people in our neighborhood say that. I, I can't say if those people came to the planning board to advocate for it. But I had the same thought, Jim. Why didn't they impose a requirement on, to, on Rudy's to put in a sidewalk? If I had to guess, if I were on the planning board, I might just say, boy, maybe that's just getting to be too much to require of this applicant to either doing the crosswalk and to throw in a sidewalk on top of it. Maybe a sidewalk is something, another project for another day that you, we could, maybe there's a grant out there somewhere, some, some way, somehow we could get a sidewalk to run at least down a portion of Broad Cove Road. So there's, there's no sidewalk? There's no sidewalk. Along that direction right. by so the church, no. They just, Where'd it go? They have a little segment of sidewalk in their little sort of island between well, the two we, driveways. You know, we have one of those on Shore Road right now. Uh, small sidewalk section. <laughs> You'd have to come out into the bike area, wouldn't it? The sidewalk would come out into the bike nope. area, wouldn't it? You know, but the, right, right, but right now the, the, it's a free-for-all in terms of where people cross. Yeah. And so, so and although the do. crosswalk would dump you into the shoulder, I guess, of Broad Cove Road, potentially, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if Maureen could tell us where it would go. Sarah? I'm in favor of going to MDOT and just seeing, when I talked to the guy, he sort of seemed like five miles per hour wasn't a huge deal in terms of the variation. I mean, how much effort is it to ask MDOT to review this and consider it? I, I would if ask I, how much effort and how much time and how much time it, does it take them to get back to us? And, and, you know, I've learned long ago. <laughs> He's actually speaking. You about never that. speak for a state agency. <laughs> Uh, but, 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 you know, but I, I do agree with Sarah. If a, if a town pushes enough and a couple of legislators call, uh, oftentimes you, you might get five miles per hour where you otherwise might not. But, but then the debate is, you know, for what length you do it and uh, some of those issues would need to be looked at. But, you know, it, it, as far as staff time, not a big deal. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So it's 40 right there, 40 miles per hour right yeah. there. Sort of where's the 40 start and the 40 end? I mean, are we going to... What the f the lengths of road would we be asking for it to go down to 35? The, the, the 40, just, just one like the four and after the crosswalk. The, four, the 40 <laughs> starts just, at the, just before you get to the end of what we call the strip mm -hmm. by that yeah. house on the right. Yeah. Uh, and it continues to approximately uh, the end by the C driveway. Mm -hmm. So where would the lowering to 35 be? I mean, if we were going to ask. Where would it it's, drop down to 35 and then presumably speed back up to 40? The, the council could attempt to define that this evening in drafting this item. I suggested that you not, I, I, wasn't, I was not inviting you to do that. Uh, you could do it. Uh, you know, I, I would think you'd most want to rely on MDOT's judgment as to the extent that that needs to happen. What you don't want is, is a bunch Thousands of, zones. you don't keep wanting yeah, to change up, down, up. So why not just instead of turning it to 40 at the, after you sort of get through the center, turn it to 35 and make it 35 until yeah. you get to in by the that, city. That would probably be the sure, case. Five so, miles different. So miles instead of going from 50 to 40, have it yeah. go from 50, 50 to 35. To 35 That's and then 35 all the way out to in by the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'm just asking. That, that's that's good. <laughs> so, I, I think that's great, idea, particularly since you know, I mean, the kid, the kids on bikes coming out of Old Ocean House, going to Broad Cove, and if that building ever gets filled behind Rudy's, there's going to be more traffic there. I think going down to 35 makes all the sense in the world. I, I was just curious: did the town planner, did the planning board talk about sort of uh, lowering to 35 at the after that stretch of 77, as Sarah suggested? Going to 35 and keeping it there till by the sea. Is that what you all have in mind? The planning board was unaware that there are restrictions on where uh, they could put crosswalks. They were comfortable with the fact that they had required a crosswalk on Shore Road as part of the 553 Shore Road okay. project and decided that this was another good example of a place to put it. However, Route 77 is not Shore Road, it's a state road, there are state standards for where you could put crosswalks. No. We'd be, we'd be happy to go to MDOT, and I just, you know, to answer the other question, the last time it took indeterminably long. I, I have two comments. One is, you know, I have no objection to it changing to 30, 35 there, and it might be marginally safe, safer, um, which is a good thing. Um, 
However, I'm concerned about sort of the reality on the, on the ground. I'm just not sure that even if it goes to 35, people are actually going to slow down. It seems to me there's sort of a natural speed to the road, and people are already whipping along at 50. I mean, I don't have strong feelings. So I, I don't know. Presumably, MDOT had a reason for having it be 40 because of the natural speed of the road, the way it's built, whatever. But my other, so we'll see what they say. But my other concern is it depends how long they're going to take to do this. You know, it's, you know what I mean? I don't want to yeah. drag this out for a year, um, and I'm not quite sure how to deal with that. But it's one thing if we can get an answer within a month. <clears throat> but uh, I know there are going, we, are, we will hear from people, if we change that speed limit, we will hear from people who don't like that it's going slower, just because as the part of the little, remember the little traffic study in the center of town, we had a fair number of people write to us and say, I don't want crosswalks, I don't want blinking lights or anything in the center of town, which seems even more appropriate for slower speed, because I'm on my way to Broad Cove and I want to blow through. So we should just be prepared if we're going to ask for a decrease in speed. We may hear from some folks. Uh, Anne, I just want to confirm that MDOT's major concern last time in not wanting to lower speed limits was, in fact, the, the, geog the geometry of the road, and the geometry of the road is such that it does support these higher speeds, and the other major factor they look at is, is traffic uh, accident data and traffic, and these areas are not recognized as uh, high, high accident locations by MDOT. Sir, given that it's election season <laughs> upon us, why don't we make a simple phone call to our three reps and encourage them to contact the local MDOT person to expedite this decision. We're not pressing them to make the decision we want. We just want a decision and see how fast we can get it answered. Yeah. And do they charge us anything? No, no, no they don't. MDOT yeah. specifically <laughs> will not come out unless they get a recommendation from the town council requesting the review. Okay. Did you have something else, sir? No. Dave? Just in terms to echo Anne's comment about not wanting to hold up site plan review for Rudy's because they could be sitting around for a year waiting for this. I mean, is there a way that the planning board could approve this and only make the construction of the crosswalk uh, a requirement if MDOT lowers the speed limit? And if they don't, then they don't have to. So we hold them up. That's yeah, the, the specific condition is that the applicant has agreed to install a crosswalk once the appropriate approvals are granted. However, I've already spoken with the applicant and have submitted a request to the planning board to lift that particular recommendation in light of this new information. So what we're trying to do is sever the, the interest in reducing the speed limit, if there is one, from the approval that was granted for Rudy's. So we, we, we could make the request of MDOT and not hold them up. And it's my hope that when this goes to the planning board with a request to eliminate that condition, that if the council decides to make this request, we can say, look, we're still pursuing your concern. It's just because of timing not tied to this particular approval. So can I so, make a yeah. motion? Let's make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the town council uh, authorizes town staff to make a request of MDOT to lower the speed limit to 35 miles per hour along the section of Route 77. Sarah Lennon said this better from, than me. From um, Fowler Road to the... No, from the no, 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 from the end of the street. That is currently 40 miles per hour. That's currently 40 miles per hour. So that's the section between oh, the antique shop, essentially. No, no, it's from oh. Old Ocean House to... Old Ocean House Road to Invite the Sea. Right. Okay. Second. Do we, uh, Can before you second that, do you, we want to put the provision of using us yeah. for elected officials? No, we're just us. behind the scenes on that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can we put something that makes sure that it doesn't hold Rudy's up, or yeah. are we just assuming that? No, because that's, not, a, that's no. not really a you, 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 you can't change planning board conditions as a council. Uh, can that's we, right. That's mm. right. Can we that's express right. an opinion? I, well, we have. I guess uh, we I'm already have. My motion, but we, we have made it as a council pretty clear to the town planner. We don't want this to hold up. I'd, I'd, I'd request you give the planning board a chance to adjust this before you tell them to adjust it. 
I think we should leave it out of motion. We, okay. We, That's fine. We've, been, we've said we're okay with that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the planning board operates independent of the council when they're doing site plan reviews, but they didn't have this information, and let's give them the chance to do the right thing. Okay. But so independent of that, whether they put in a crosswalk, don't put in a crosswalk, approve it or whatever, we're just asking. The concern is duly for, noted. For 35 in that section. Okay. Was there a second? I second it. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Okay. Voting process. Thank you very much. Um, our first attempt to um, disseminate the information on the upcoming June 8th election, if you recall, was an insert in the tax bills um, that went out in mid-February. <coughs> Uh, what we try to do is kind of outline um, for you what the June 8th um, primary and referendum elections will look like. Um, the logistics are very challenging and confusing um, because there are actually going to be four elections held at the same time. You have the primary election uh, for the candidates for the Democratic Republican and Green Independent Party to elect their candidates to um, run at the general election in November. We have the Fort Williams question, uh, the special referendum question for the town. We have um, the school budget um, <coughs> referendum question to adopt the school budget, and the state also has a referendum uh, question as well. Um, Cape Elizabeth will have a total of nine ballots um, because, again, the, the three candidate ballots and there's two legislative districts, so there'll be six candidate ballots. Again, the state referendum ballots, the town referendum ballot on Fort Williams, and the school budget referendum ballot. Um, because the school budget vote is under separate legislation than the others in terms of absentee balloting. Um, we're actually going to be um, having to separate mailings and so forth for those elections. So in other words, if somebody comes in and they are enrolled in a political party, they will get their party ballot, the state referendum ballot, and the Fort Williams ballot. If they have to have an absentee ballot application, they will fill out that application for those ballots. Because a school ballot under that law is not available until after the council votes on what to send to the public at the end of May, if they want to vote that ballot absentee and that requires an application, they're going to have to, the voters going to have to um, fill out a separate application for that ballot. So what that means logistically for staff is we're going to have a separate, physically separate ballots for those first three um, ballots. We also are going to be um, having to keep a separate voter list. So basically we're doing everything twice. Um, there's no way around that because of the absentee balloting process and the, the different um, legislation that we are working under. So we feel it's important for the residents to, to keep this in mind. Um, we are encouraging folks to vote if they are available at the polling place on Tuesday, June 8th. Uh, I'm still trying to work out logistics for that because, again, even when you go to the polls on June 8th, we're going to have to have two separate voting lists at the polls as well. Um, the town manager and I have talked about um, how best to serve our citizens through this election process. Um, staffing levels at the town hall, the way they are, um, are at a minimum at best just on a, on a regular day. When we throw this in, um, it really complicates things. Um, so what the manager and I are working toward um, is to uh, on election day, move the administrative staff here at Town Hall down to the high school 
um, to help out in the election. Um, that means that the town clerk's office and the tax office um, would be closed on that day. Again, those employees will be working, but just at, at the high school. Um, as I said, on any given election, it's really hard to staff the polling place because of our staff here that's needed and, and staff up here at Town Hall. Um, we've, Michael and I have talked about this in the past. There are many other communities that have done it for years. It's election day and the full forces go to the polls to serve the residents um, and they take um, staff from different departments. That, that is not unusual at all and we'd like to use this as an opportunity to, um, to do that as well. Um, I anticipate we will um, have staff from assessing codes planning, uh, helping maybe even during the absentee balloting process um, and on election day school central staff um, has offered to help as well as they can. Uh, police chief and fire chief have offered to help. So um, we have everybody on board with that. But um, again, it, it's going to be very confusing. Um, we will do our best to walk through people through the process um, and we just encourage folks to vote on June 8th on election day if they can. When you say um, absentee voting, does that include early voting for the huge hassle factor or is that going to kind of proceed as usual? Are you talking about the mailing out? Maine does not have early voting. Early voting is, is different in that when they come in and vote the ballot, they put it in the machine. They don't have all the envelopes and the applications. So, so it's going to complicate this. This yeah, thing that you hear too. It is because, again, when folks come in, particularly toward the end of the month, they're going to want to vote the state ballots and then the school ballot. And if they want to take the ballot out, we have to account for that. So they're going to have to, have to fill out two separate absentee ballot applications. They, they squawk now at filling out one. I can't imagine when they're going to fill out and, two. And part of this is because of the result of what the legislature passed. This is, again, an unfunded mandate, really, that falls down on municipalities. It's because the legislature passed the state, the school budget rules with this 10-day absentee ballot process, you know, the 10-day the window. Um, of voting as opposed to all sorts of other issues or what is it 30 days? 30 days. So this is an example of the state at work. Yeah, just the, the legislature just did pass emergency legislation extending that out to 30 days just while, while you were gone. However, all our budget schedule is predicated on the old system. So next year this won't happen? This won't happen next well, year. Thank you. I've been out of town for the past week and I didn't know that but that that is good news, so I have to give them credit for somewhat coming to their senses um, on this issue. One more question. Sarah? We have a pretty big window between when we meet the final time with the school board and sort of, and then when we hold the public hearing, is that cast in stone? We could back that thing up a week or 10 days. Would that help? Can I answer that question? Sure. You, you meet with the school board on May 13th, you are due to meet with them, uh, excuse me, on May 6th and May 13th. Uh, on May 13th, following the Finance Committee, you have to vote to set a public hearing. Uh, between the public hearing and the, uh, the you, you have to advertise the public hearing with at least seven days' notice in the newspaper. I didn't know that. Yeah, so you really, with getting the notice to the newspaper, it's about 10 days. That's why it's scheduled from the 13th to the 24th, is to give time for the advertising. Thank you. Also, if I, Good thought, though. Also, if I may, unless you could back that up 30 days, we'd still be working on two separate times that ballots were, are available. Um, I just want to mention also on the school budget vote, there will be a question to whether or not to continue um, approving the school budget through the referendum process since this is year three. So. Folks may want to take that into consideration. For another three years? Right, it's every three years. It's every third year. Frank? Um, th there's nothing we could have done to avoid this, just in terms of trying to think about next year, if we can change anything. Because it, it's just the nature of everything. It's the nature of the um, laws as they stand, or 
before the emergency legislation for the, the school vote. Um, the, the added um, ballot and expense for the town is the Fort Williams question. That's going to be a loan question on a ballot. We have to print that. And again, that goes out 30 days before. We could not save that Fort Williams question to go out with the school to avoid the expense of that second municipal ballot. And, and that's because of the drum, I think it was drum, somebody, uh, the opinion that said they, it had to be on a separate. No, that was a two to be on a separate. Uh, that was on the two school questions because we originally. I thought, uh, yeah. but I thought perhaps I read this that uh, we couldn't have Fort Williams question. Had to have its own special ballot. It does have to have it because of those absentees for Fort Williams question okay. has to go up there. Okay. okay. The the, wow. the Drummond Woodsum opinion you're referring to required that the budget validation continuance vote and the budget validation vote be on the same ballot. And subsequently, Sorry. the legislature saw the Drummond Woodsum opinion and enacted that into uh, the law. Okay. Sorry. I, I misunderstood that a little bit. The fact that the Fort Williams one has to go out 30 days before, um, did that person know that it's advisory, not binding? The that Drummond Woodsum question advisory was, didn't have anything to do with the Fort Williams. So Fort Williams has to be a separate ballot, separate piece of paper, separate 30 days, not, even if it's just advisory? Yeah, I don't see why we can't have the f it's like a question eh? the Fort Williams one. Why does that have to have a 30 day? Kind of We're assuming it went under the, the referendum okay. piece yes. of the I statute that it requires 30 days. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just but, actually, uh, Red, could, could you turn down the sound in the chamber a little bit? It's some, there's some odd echoes. And you can all speak up and use the microphone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, it's just a technicality we could look into. Yeah, I think it's sort of too late to change horses in midstream at this point, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. You'll see how it goes. And so then we'll revamp as necessary, I guess. And Deborah, you're encouraging, or I, I guess I am encouraging residents to consider voting at the high school on the day of the election. Yes. That would minimize the additional work that is uh, generated by the absentee voting system. Obviously, people have the right to do that. And there are good reasons why people do that. But if you can possibly vote at the high school on election day, that would be preferable. Um, okay. Deb, could, Jim? You, could you explain that again on the advisory nature of that ballot? Why do we have to follow that 30-day requirement? I mean, you're using a referendum basis for determining how the process works. Is that right? Mm -hmm. the type do, we, of do we have to? It's not if really it's, a referendum. If it's, just a, if it's really just it's, advisory, it's like a questionnaire, uh, does that, I mean, I mean, with all the yes, additional work that, it, you, yeah. We, we, we have to have the other system for the state primary ballots with the 30 days anyway. The, the, so it's riding on the same system, not necessarily creating a separate it sounds like it's going out separately. It's the, it's because it's a single ballot all by itself. It's the school piece that's that ten day. It's in the, the school piece that's creating an issue. If you move the referendum or the question for Fort Williams back to the school piece, you still got the same problem, don't you? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't back. matter where that question, where the Fort Williams question sits. It, no, it's, it's just the, the expense school. of an added ballot. Right. Right. Oh, the expense of the expense. Yeah. I was just saying, if it's, it's just. Like, if it's just advisory in nature, that's all. And is it more expensive to have to give it 30 days? Because technically, we really don't have to give it 30 days, or do we? If you don't consider a referendum, does it loosen up some of the regulations that are causing you expense? I guess I would, want, hugs. I would want legal opinion on that. Because it's technically not a referendum. Hmm. But, right, so I, I balance. I hear what you're saying. That was what I was thinking I was going towards whether we could put it on the tent, but, but I wonder how much a legal opinion would cost yeah. versus the savings. I don't want to end up... Well, given that we've already been rendered a legal opinion, wouldn't it make sense that the lawyer might be able to but it's consider, a it's consider that a question without charging a whole bunch more again? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a different would question. It, if, it, if, if we could do it, would it save us any money? It, it would save you... At 24 cents a ballot, about $840 to print a separate ballot for Fort Williams. And it would save possibly mailing charges. So. I think it's worth asking the question of a lawyer. 
I don't know, it depends on their hourly fee. I mean, $840 is the maximum amount it would save. And how much of would everybody's time, you know, to get a legal opinion? I don't know, can you get a good legal opinion for $840? I certainly hope so. I, I'm well, not sure I, what the legal opinion is you're asking. Is, is the opinion, are you asking to reduce the time that that ballot's available from 30 days to 14? I guess, what, I 14? guess the, question, is that what you're asking? the question that I think we're asking is, could you have the Fort Williams co advisory question uh, on the same paper ballot as the two school questions right. to save you from having a separate piece of paper, which would save $840, but I am not entirely sure. In fact, I'm somewhat doubtful that we could get a legal, a legal quest, a question answered counting staff time and everything for $840. Let me ask Deborah a question. Have we ever put state ballots and local issues on the same ballot? No, the state doesn't allow local questions to go on the state ballot. Yeah. But this is not a state issue. So I'm, I'll stop. This is the last thing I'll say. But I, I don't understand why we need a legal opinion. And I don't understand why we're considering it a statute. And I don't understand why. It's it's the equivalent of putting a questionnaire in the courier. It's, an, it's, it's merely gauging people's opinion. It's advisory. So it doesn't really fall any, under any law, does it? Right. We can but sort of I, do what we want. I think the, the we, issue. We could hand the thing out at the door and have them check. But the issue, I think, for uh, investigation would be not about the Fort Williams question, about can you put anything else on that school ballot? Yeah, that would be the question. You know, can the school. Uh, mm. The school questions are defined by the state legislature in the law as you can only say this, they're very precise about some wording and then not about some other stuff. You know, although we do have our advisory question that yeah, too, yeah, too, say, too high, too low. Or lower. Yeah, we so ask. really, we have three questions on our school ballot. Right, One, so it, we add you with approve it. Do we want to say too high or and too low? And we've got an advisory too high, just right, just low question. So could we have an advisory question farther down on Fort Williams? We have not done the analysis yet to see whether or not you're still allowed with the new emergency legislation to have the too high, too low. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we have not done the analysis yet. I just. Yeah, and I might not want to do that analysis because I, I personally think it's very helpful to find out if it fails, if it fails because it's too high, too low, or whatever. Right, right. Because that way, if you have to loop through, you at least have a sense of where to set the next number at. <clears throat> So, so I would sort of prefer not to ask that question because once you've asked it, then you know the answer, and if it goes the wrong way. So, you know, the purpose of this report was for, <laughs> for you to all understand and for the citizens to understand. How uh, well, ununderstandable like it is. No, that, that the balloting process is very complicated, uh, and particularly what, you know, Deb didn't highlight it, but you also have two different house districts, so you have six sets of ballots, you know, there for the three parties. Uh, so that's number one. Is there going to be a bond issue on there today? There's a bond issue. Yes. Yeah, there's a bond yes. issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, you know, we, in, we will gear up as much as we can to serve everyone best on Election Day. Thank you. I want to thank in advance Deborah Lane and all your various election workers and the town <laughs> staff that are going to have to deal with this. And I would like to echo David Sherman's recommendation that, of, of course, people, if they can't vote at the polls, they certainly have a right to absentee vote, but it would be really helpful, if at all possible, to vote at the high school on Election Day. So. Should we have extended hours because of that? I know the hours are very long as, as yeah. we, they are. No, the, 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 the thing we, we have no. looked at is, <laughs> the thing we've looked at is getting a third uh, ballot box in order so we don't have the issue we had in election, what, four Primary years ago? Primary turnout would the not be as high as a general, like the last presidential well, election. So. I think everyone's going to be so excited about all these different pieces of paper. You know, a lot of them are going to show up. Yeah. Yeah. They may all stay away after hearing about this. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, you very much for your report, Deborah. Moving on, uh, the municipal financial benchmarks, uh, we, well, I'm sorry. I'm just wondering, do we need to make to a quickly? motion to take up? Uh, uh, the 10 yes. o'clock rule to take up new business after 10 It's 10.30, I thought. Is, t is it 10.30? Yeah, and if I'm okay. hoping we can just No, I'd be happy. Speed. I'm wondering if could we, then I, I'm wondering if we would consider a motion to, to take item 55 out of order. 
I'm assuming that it may be the last item for the town planner to address tonight. I'm wondering if we could just do that next. That's fine if you want to make that motion. So moved. I second it. Uh, discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? That's unanimous to take number 55 out of order, which is the Henry Berry Estate easement deed. Thank you, David. Uh, is, does this need to be introduced? Does any counselor feel a need to have this introduced? Nobody feels a need. Uh, would you like to make a motion? Sure, I would make a motion that we accept the easement uh, from the estate of Henry N. Berry III uh, relating to that portion of Hannaford Cove Road uh, that is actually currently located on the estate property. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Discussion? Uh, I just want to thank um, the heirs um, of Henry Berry, who I served with on the council when I, very, when I started. He was a good guy, a good counselor, and uh, his family is obviously generous to offer us this easement. So I just want to thank them. So all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And now we go back to item number 52. Um, does anybody want, we all received the municipal financial benchmarks of 2009, which is very useful information. Is it online, Michael, yet? It's at the council packet section of the website. I'm not sure if it's in the document section. Yet. I would encourage citizens to look through it. We might want to somehow link it to something so people can find it. Um, do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion to acknowledge receipt of the municipal financial benchmarks study for 2009, which is based on the audited June 30, 2009 financial statements for the most part. I know there were a couple exceptions, and I want to thank the manager for uh, putting this together. It's very valuable information. <coughs> Do I hear a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Question. Mike, I'm wondering if there's ever been an attempt to change the ratios that are, are being looked at on that. There's a number of ratios a number of our comparisons, a number of the comparisons done on a per capita basis. And because we have smaller households than the average, we don't look as good. Uh, and in fact, we might look better if other, mm -hmm. other metrics were looked at. Um, on a per household basis? Yeah, maybe per household, or, or in the case of public works, it could be road mine. I mean, something that's more reflective, because it's, it clearly isn't in a lot, yeah. a lot of instances. No, uh, it, does, it has a lot of those inherent weaknesses. And, yeah. One thing that will be helpful is the, we'll have the census data, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, and we'll have better numbers uh, to, to uh, accurately compare to. I, I'm sure Mike would be willing to hear any suggestions that people have. I, I don't know if I mentioned here, I did have a meeting recently with the managers of Cumberland, Yarmouth, and Falmouth about doing a lot more in the way of benchmarking and particularly service levels and some of the, I think, some of the things you're getting at, Frank. Good. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Quarterly financial report. Mike, do you want to yeah, say something? Uh, again, uh, as it indicates, we're in, we're in very good shape. Uh, revenues are, uh, are doing very well. Uh, and expenditures, uh, for the reasons stated in the report, are about 230000 under budget. If you look, you add the two numbers, it's a net positive about four hundred and fifty seven thousand uh, dollars however you know we are proposing to use two hundred and ten thousand of that to help fund next year's budget and there's also i don't have a handle yet quite frankly on how much the schools are actually de reducing their surplus level uh, so until we get their budget after tomorrow night uh, you know i it's uh, will be I, my senses will be close to the target it's in the town council policy for the level of undesignated surplus. I, I did have one question, Mike. On the second page, it said, um, talking about uh, the gain, it says 210,000 of that amount set to be, with 210,000 of that amount set to be used to help fund the 2000, fiscal 11 budget. Yes. The rise in surplus would be $247,000, which yes. should make up for some of the school use of sur surplus to help fund their budget next year yes it, was it next year or are we transferring some no we're not trans no no there's no don't you mean no for the proposal. current year no i mean in 
in their budget, they proposed a certain amount of surplus to be used. And I'm not sure how much undesignated fund balance they're going to have oh, after I see. I see. whatever they're proposing to use of their portion of the undesignated surplus. Okay. I just wasn't and, sure and, you know, they, that meant the, the numbers have been all over the place, you know, with all the different alternatives. Until I get a piece of paper, I, you know, from the board, I'm not... So you just mean from solutions. sort of the overall... Council. Yeah, my, my sense is they're reducing their overall level of undesignated surplus, but okay. until we see the budget, I don't know what it's going to be. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood. That's what it's about. Okay. Um, do we need to uh, receive this report? Can I make a motion? Sure. Move we accept the quarterly financial report. With thanks to the town manager. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any questions or uh, discussion? All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to come with Mike on conservative forecasting. Yes, <laughs> how really, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, having upside surprises is a really good thing in this environment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here, here. Any other uh, questions or discussion? Paul? Just, just, if I, <laughs> just real quick, Frank, some of it was conservative, some wasn't conservative. Overall, it was conservative. <laughs> if you look, I don't think there's ever been as many variances of some were way off high, some were way off low. Investment income were getting killed. Yeah. Okay. All in, <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying. We got five minutes. <laughs> appointments Committee report. Chair of the Appointments Committee is Penny Jordan. Would you like to make a motion? I, let's see. Let's see. How long can no, I take? No it? dithering. <laughs> Wind it up, wind it up. We'll read the name. Okay, I would love to make a motion. I would like to move that um, William H. Marshall of 10 Wildwood Drive be appointed to the Personnel Appeals Board. And we interviewed uh, two candidates, both of which were fantastic. Um, and uh, we feel that uh, Mr. Marshall definitely has the background to be able to uh, participate and be a member of this board, and um, so I'd like to put him forward as candidate. I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you to the Appointments Committee. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Okay. And our last item is item number 56, which is a... Um, uh, request to go into executive session. However, I'm just going to say, do we have any citizens here for discussion of items not on the agenda? We could do that now. I don't see anybody coming forward, so that's done. So now I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. 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 Moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Second.